Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Mormon Stories Podcast. I am your host, John DeLynn. It is May 30th, 2022. We are recording here in the Mormon Story Studios in uh, somewhere near Salt Lake City, Utah, on holiday. And I am super excited for today's interview. Um, I'm here with Jen. Hey, Jen. Hey. Jen Camp. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us, Jen. Of course. Why are we working on Memorial Day? Right? Because I'm an abusive boss. <laughs> No, just worked out that it worked out this year. There was consent. Yeah. But anyway, <laughs> thanks for coming in on Memorial Day. You're welcome. <laughs> We're obviously pre-recording today. Um, so uh, today's interviewee is someone who I've been kind of following for, I don't know, four or five years. I, I don't know how long it's been, but today we're interviewing... Uh, my friend, Rachel Wonderly. Hey, Rachel. Hey, everyone. How's it going? <laughs> <laughs> Super happy to have you. I think we were talking before the show that I think my friend Liz Layton, yeah. who I interviewed on Mormon Stories previously, she's a she was a jazz dancer and mm -hmm. she's done a lot of work on suicide um, prevent, prevention. So it's it was a it was a powerful interview for me. Anyway, I think Liz made me aware of you years ago. Yeah, we've run, we've crossed paths to some degree for a while, but it's nice to finally be here and yeah, yeah. chat. This is exciting. Yeah, so I always like to give kind of a preview of what we're going to be talking about. So this is how I think about it. Um, you know, we're going to be talking about, it, it's going to be a, tr a traditional long form Mormon stories interview of Rachel's faith journey. She was definitely raised Mormon, but we're going to be talking about her um, leaving Mormonism and converting to, I don't know if you call it non-denominational Christianity yeah. or evangelical Christianity. Both, both work. Okay. Yep. And that was here in, in Utah. So leaving Mormonism to join non-denominational Christianity in Utah and becoming kind of a youth minister and a pastor worship, in training. Yeah. Worship pastor to a certain extent. There was no pastor in that role. So we'll just call it that <laughs> me and one other guy worship pastors. Yeah. But you were on training. You were in training. We were to in training a, to become ordained as pastors, I, probably two years into the future. But um, yeah, we were in. We were sitting in a pastoral role. Yeah, so that's interesting. How how a Mormon becomes kind of a a pastor in training at a, at a Christian church, and we've done recently a lot of interviews, whether it's with Stephen Pinecker or uh, Randy Bell or others. I have some dear friends who are Christians. Uh, and you know, we're obviously supportive of everyone's journeys. Um, but today what's going to be slightly different from some of those other episodes is recently you've, and this is where I kind of got back in touch with you recently, you left, uh, Christianity and you've been TikToking kind of as an ex-Christian, yes. which was surprising because I, I just remember watching your, your TikTok or Instagram or YouTube videos where you're singing Christian songs and like really yes. Jesus up as I sometimes like to say. So. I was all in for Jesus. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So how does someone go from Mormon to Christian will be part of this. Uh, and I'll say evangelical Christian or non denominational Christian. And then how does someone go from that to ex Christian? That's going to be kind of today's episode. And the, you, you know, you do a lot of work in suicide prevention. Yes. You, you'll, we'll be talking about your Mormon marriage and a Mormon divorce, being single in Utah, mm -hmm. you know, as, as a divorced woman, as a Christian, as an ex-Christian. So there's that. Yeah. And then you, you have a real passion around suicidality. So I assume that you have experienced some suicidal ideation yourself, and that's part of what drives your passion. Yep, absolutely. Right? Yep. So we'll be talking about some of that as well. Awesome. Yeah? Yeah. Well, thanks Sweet. for joining us on, on the holiday. My pleasure. Thanks for having yeah. me. You ready for this, Jen? I'm so ready. All right. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, where does your Mormon story begin, Rachel? The day I was born. <laughs> <laughs> I was born into the Mormon church. We, My parents met at the University of Utah, and um, I was born in Utah. We very quickly moved to the East Coast so that my dad could go to law school, and we lived in Boston and D.C. and New York, and that's where I grew up. Um, so you, I grew where up. Where were you in the birth order? I'm the oldest. Of how many kids? Of seven. Whoa, seven kids. Seven kids, yes, falling right into the stereotype. So <laughs> three of them are adopted, though. So I grew up with um, being the oldest of four, and then the other three were adopted about 10 years ago. 
Uh, and yeah, we grew up mainly in DC and New York as pretty much the only Mormon in the area. So it was a really unique experience for sure. Let me ask you, so I, I recognized your last name because I served on the Sunstone board with an Earl Wonderly. We talked about this. Yeah. So I asked you if, if that was family and, and he was a really smart dude and you just told me he passed away recently. Yeah. He published a book, I think with signature book on, on the book of Mormon. And I knew him to be a really smart, thoughtful guy. Yes. So that was your grandpa's brother. Is that yes. right? Mm -hmm. So your dad's uncle. Yeah. So that makes me want to know. Uh, and, and if your dad went to Harvard Law School, I think you told me that. Yeah. It made me want to know about your dad's kind of upbringing and his parents. Just a, a quick little profile. Yeah. Because it sounds like the Wonderly family is kind of interesting a little bit. Well, they are interesting because they're all immigrants from Switzerland. Okay. So. My dad's parents and that they, well, their parents were first generation Americans. So they traveled here from Switzerland. A lot of them did. And I mean, my dad grew up wearing later hosen sometimes. And really? yeah, we were very, very Swiss. So, um, a lot of my family is converts to the Mormon church. Um, my, like my great grandparents and things like that. And so they grew up having a very different taste in their mouth of kind of what Mormonism was. They got, they got the, they got a different translation of it probably and they kind of just viewed it more of a culture rather than a deeply embedded religion that they followed the doctrine to to the t i think they really just appreciated the culture and the community that mormonism brought that's your grandparents my grandparents and where did yeah, they and where did they live mostly where did they, they raise all their came family? to utah so everyone was my parents were all uh born and raised in salt lake city what high school would your i guess your your dad my my dad went to Highland and my mom went to Cottonwood. Okay. All right. So, so Salt Lake County. Yeah. So they're all like, they've been in Salt Lake County for a long time. And same with my grandparents. Okay. You know, there's a big Swiss days thing in Midway Hebrew. Were, was your yes. family involved in that? We never went there for what? some reason. That's I know. Swiss blasphemy. It's, my, I, it's terrible. It's terrible. My grandparents who would have made us go there didn't have the uh, social media information to tell them that that was going on. They so didn't even know about They didn't Swiss even days? know it was going on. Jen, you were laughing. Have you been to Swiss days? <laughs> yeah. You like Swiss days? Yeah. I went for years, every year. Until, until it got... Oh. so busy that it was just not worth it for me to find a parking place. Did, did you go for the sauerkraut? No. <laughs> we put sauerkraut on everything, I will say. We still we still eat food as if we we're exceptionally Swiss. We just don't go to Swiss days for it. <laughs> but now I should. I should make that a tradition. I dated a girl at BYU who, whose family lived there. A Probst is the last name. And uh, I found out that like the steaks there prepare that sauerkraut all year long. They do. And it's That's like, a, it was like I, I served in a booth once where they're serving the sauerkraut to all the Swiss days people. Oh, so yeah, we but they love have to bury it. I mean, you have to like bury it underground for a long yeah. period, you know, like ferments and yep. I'm surprised there's not like cabbage alcohol or something. I know. I know. <laughs> it's yeah. We put sauerkraut on pretty much everything. It's, it's something that every time one of us gets a new boyfriend or girlfriend <laughs> and we're in, initiating them into the family, they have to make it past Christmas dinner, which is a very big Swiss tradition of ours. And if they don't like it, we just end up giving, them crap for the rest of the year like i guess you guys aren't accepted into the family until you like weenies and sauerkraut <laughs> and knuffle which is a, a mac and cheese that's very swiss mm, okay all right so do you I'm, i know i'm just geeking out on your family what it was your grandpa's profession uh he's also a lawyer he's an okay do you mm -hmm. know what kind i have no okay, idea that's fine that's fine <laughs> so a smart family kind of a really yeah. intelligent family yes uh, I, I I guess I shouldn't say all lawyers are smart, but, but <laughs> yeah, I mean. you know they're 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 very intelligent. They all they all dedicated a lot of their time to school. I mean, a lot of the opportunities that their parents had, um, they didn't have a lot of school opportunities. So I think when it came to my grandparents and down and my parents' generation, they really went hard when it came to school and education because their their parents didn't receive that. So, what was your mom's background? My mom is. Uh, well, she, she was born and raised in Utah as well. Um, her family is English and German as well. Um, raised Mormon. She was raised Mormon her whole life. Her parents were Mormon pretty much their whole life. And, um, 
she's the oldest of seven as well. So kind of grew up poor and just kind of trying to get by. She helped raise a lot of the, her siblings and things like that. So, um, pretty standard, nothing okay. too special. So your parents, when they met and got married, how into the church do you think they were? How, um, mo how Mormon was your early family, like that you were born into? How Mormon was it or non-Mormon or, or was, liberal or any of that? Yeah, I would say it was fairly moderate. My parents, they met in college and like my dad was a part of a frat and, you know, he partied. At the and U. At the U. At the yeah, U. Yeah. yeah, he was a Sigma Chi at the U. And, um, he kind of lived it up. And when they got married, I, my mom was more active in the church. And so I think they stayed in the church because she wanted to stay in the church. And then knowing that they were going to move all over, they knew they needed that tight knit community to stay with them. So I think my dad stayed for convenience purposes, but as far as what they believed in their heart of hearts, I think they stayed pretty much on the surface. Like I identify as Mormon, but I don't fully know what that means. I'm not going to dig too deep into what that means. It's kind of how they raised us. So, but yeah, I mean, they're pretty much, they're in between. They weren't super fundamentalist staunch or anything, but we definitely had to go to church all three hours growing up, no matter what, no friends on Sunday type thing. So there was still like heavy specific to Mormon rules that we followed that I remember growing up with. So like scripture study and family prayer. We did family, family home, home evening. evening. Yeah, we did family home evening. We'd pray before meals, but we wouldn't pray over everything. It's not like we'd pray before a road trip necessarily for safety. We wouldn't go to that extent, but I had cousins who would. We were kind of in between where we'd we'd pray over our meals. We'd have family home evening. We couldn't hang out with friends on Sundays. and um, But on our way home from church in New York, we'd always stop by this Indian restaurant every single Sunday. So technically we would not keep the Sabbath day holy, but only if it was with our family. So as long as we were breaking the Sabbath with our family, that was fine. <laughs> That's kind of where they drew the line. <laughs> so when you moved to, you, I assume you moved to Boston for your dad to go to law school. Yeah. And then New York, was that like some big firm that hired your dad out of law school, basically? Yeah, we went to D.C. first, and then I know he was a part of Philip Morris um, when we moved to New York. And yeah, big firm there. Um, we moved to Manhattan and kind of like lived that life for a couple of years, which was crazy. Four kids in Manhattan. I don't know how my mom did that, but here we are. Alive. Do you remember Manhattan? I totally do. Yeah. I was, I was nine, 10 and 11 when we lived in Manhattan. Do you remember Boston? I don't remember Boston. I was okay. a toddler there. I remember Maryland and I remember, um, New York completely. I mean, we didn't move to Utah till I was in high school. So I remember New York very well. So Philip Morris, I know what that means. Um, I mean that, and I don't know how much you even want to talk for your dad, but Philip Morris is a tobacco company. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you had mentioned a little bit about your dad's job before. Like, obviously, that's kind of like a, a Mormon owning a casino. Like, if if alcohol or tobacco were kind of prohibited, word of wisdom wise, I wonder what that was like for your dad to work for a tobacco company. Yeah, you know, he's never really talked about it. Really? It, yeah. You never he, like, Dad, what's up with this tobacco stuff? We're just barely getting to the point in this last year where we're all open about all the stuff that we grew up with and kind of what was weird, what wasn't. So that conversation will definitely be one that will be had. But no, we haven't we haven't hit that one yet. It was kind of always just this thing we knew about, and we didn't think it was weird because he didn't make it weird. He was just like, yep, this is what I do, and... We also go to church and that's where it stopped. And we didn't question him. <laughs> we didn't question anything he did really. So your family didn't necessarily have a culture of talking about the hard or awkward stuff? Mm -mm. You... No, we definitely, <laughs> we do not, we did not talk about emotions or hard things or mental health or anything mm. like that growing up at all really. Mm. I mean, that's definitely Mormon and it's probably human on some level too. Yeah. Yeah. Man, I remember growing up, like there was a time where tobacco was way more popular and they, there was this moment where like all these, like all these tobacco companies were called before Congress on Capitol Hill and all these tobacco executives like swore that they did not believe that, that tobacco caused cancer. And it was this real... <laughs> 
it was kind of this uh, watershed moment of like truth and legal stuff and the law and health because all these executives were like, you know, b because tobacco companies had been not wanting to acknowledge that tobacco caused cancer, even though the warning label on the side. But then right. there's a question about how they marketed. Did they market to youth? Did they mark with the candy cigarettes? Were they marketing to young kids? And but but it's like it's almost Mormon. It's almost faith crisis related when you look back at that footage of these tobacco executives all swearing that they did not believe that tobacco caused cancer. It, it's confirmation bias kind of at its right. fullest. So Right. It's like, did they really not know or did they just not look past the surface? Because yeah. what I've found with a lot of people who have grown up in a staunch religion of sorts is just the, the lack of research is is potent. It's just, there's so much information right there and it doesn't take that much research to look into it, but out of fear, a lot of us don't for a long time. Yeah. And when you finally break through, you're like, wow, this was right over the other fence, yeah. right in the other kid's backyard. And that's, I'm sure your dad's amazing, but I'm, I'm guessing that would be interesting to talk to him about how he how he's worked through that in his mind. Yeah, but. I'm taking mental notes now <laughs> of all the things I'm going to go back to my family and ask him about. <laughs> but this is your podcast, not his. I'm going to grill so. him with questions. <laughs> but it, did your dad, like, did he ever serve bishop or stake president or any of those types of callings? He was in the bishopric in the singles ward in Manhattan. Oh. And that was really interesting. I remember that because everyone that he brought over when we would have an activity were... People as a nine-year-old that I, I, I hate saying this now, but I was like afraid of that group of people. It was a very eccentric group of people who were just very different on the surface. And at the time growing up Mormon, I just didn't even know how to, how to handle that. But my dad would always have them over and he was part of a bishopric there. He always served as a Sunday school teacher. Um, when I was growing up, I remember him very much being heavily embedded in Sunday school teaching and he did serve a mission. So he went on a mission to South Africa and my mom was young women's president the whole time that I was in young women's. Mm. So they, they were very involved when it came to like service and callings and things like that. It's just the, the heart posture behind the belief system and how deeply it was ingrained into their actual brain, I think was still very surface level. It's just, I mean, I think that's how religion is for many Christians in the United States, whether it's Lutheran or Presbyterian or even Catholic, you just, you do it because that's what you do. Yeah. It's not necessarily some, some huge intellectual commitment. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You, yeah. I think a lot more people than I thought operate in that way. Uh, even my brother who I thought was super staunch Mormon just left and was telling me like, you know, I had never really thought as deeply about it as you did growing up. So for me to leave it coming from him, he's saying this for, for me to leave it, it's not that big of a deal other than I have to now reframe how I view just culture and life in general. But like, as far as finding out the, that a belief system was just not true of sorts that he'd never really dealt with the pain of that. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering, I guess it was kind of an affluent upbringing because if your dad's like a New York attorney for a big Fortune 500 company, it must have been a kind of an affluent Mormon upbringing. Yeah. Like, fair to say? Yeah, that's totally fair. Yeah. What was that like? Nice? Uh, um, it, was, it was nice, For the rest you know? of us who didn't grow up that way? <laughs> <laughs> it was nice. Like, well, I mean, Jed, I shouldn't had... speak for you. Yeah. <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, we had family members just in our extended family who raised their kids differently. Like I have cousins who were raised way more strict than, than we were. So when we would have just family dinners on Sunday, when we moved back to Utah, it was very strange because we were all at different levels kind of, of, of Mormonism, but I appreciated the degree and level in which my parents raised us. Cause I feel like it was a very happy medium and they were very accepting of other cultures. I mean, we all, of my friends in New York were either Catholic or Jewish. So I spent most of my upbringing going to bar and bat mitzvahs and Catholic mass and things like that. And 
my parents really embraced other people's culture um, while also making sure we knew that that's not our culture, though. Like, you will follow these rules, but we'll be accepting of all other cultures, which I appreciate now, having lived in Utah for a long period of time. I appreciate the uh, cultural differences that I grew up with because you don't get to experience that as much here. All right. So any anything about your story prior to moving to Utah that's important for you to tell either for your story or for your faith journey, any things that happened to you growing up prior to moving to Utah? No, when it, no, when it came to that type of stuff, I mean, there was, yeah, there was nothing really huge or significant that happened before that. I feel like I was raised pretty moderately Mormon throughout that time. And then it wasn't till Utah. I mean, I guess the most important thing to know is before I moved to Utah, I, viewed Mormonism as my full identity to the point where I would do school projects on the fact that I was Mormon because to everybody else, that was like, they didn't know anything about it. That was super unique. So I could kind of do whatever I wanted and they would think whatever that was, was cool. I didn't like curse. I was the only one in my friend group who didn't drink in high school, um, in New York. And so I guess the only thing to know is prior to moving to Utah, I was like the Molly Mo of all sorts. I just, that was who I was as a person. And that, what grade did you move here? We moved here my sophomore year of high school. Of high school. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I didn't ask you your favorite primary songs. Did you have favorite primary, primary songs? Um, I love to see the temple. I loved that one. And families, families to are together forever. Yeah. I'm going there someday. I think I sang that one at my baptism and families are together forever. Those yeah, two were my favorite okay. that I can remember. Were you singing at a young age? Were you into music? Oh yeah, oh yeah. We did you my, go to Broadway musicals while you were in New York? I I did some off Broadway stuff, and I did know people who did Broadway. Um, I was more embedded in our high school musicals, which were huge back there. Um, but but yeah, I mean, we were put into the primary programs, obviously, but my sibling group was always the go-to call for Christmas program stuff. And um, my mom was really good at putting together all of the shows for the church. So she would get in, put in charge of all the activities, which meant that we were on the front doing something that had to do with singing and dancing for, for the church. So we grew up singing in everything. That was a family thing, singing? Was yeah. Family? Yeah, I, I think I'm the one that took off with it the most, for sure, especially at this point. But for the most part, everybody in my family can sing to a certain degree, and we would always have, uh, like, sibling songs, just breaking out in harmony, left and right, in the kitchen. It's just outrageous. Von Trapp, basically Von Trapp <laughs> we are the Yes, we are the Mormon <laughs> version of the Von Trapp family, and we joke about that all the time. Oh, really? We Aww. specifically say that, yeah. That's one of my favorites. It's, it, it's yeah. hilarious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's hilarious. I mean, everybody who, who has come into the family permanently or temporarily knows that's just, we're not going to have a cleaning party in the kitchen without five part harms <laughs> going on at all times. <laughs> I love it. So it's a lot for a lot of, for people. <laughs> it's a big initiation into the group. But yeah, we were doing singing and, and stuff like that. Music related stuff my whole life from the time I could talk. Was there, was there any particular style of music that you loved or, or like uh, performers or musicals or that were influential um, to you? I, I mean, I loved Broadway musicals. Broadway, Les like, Mis and Aida were my two favorites. When Wicked came out, that was great. But Les Mis was the first show I ever saw. I was 10 years old in Manhattan. It was the first one I ever saw, and I fell in love with it. And now looking back, I'm like, that's a pretty complex show for a 10 year old to just be like, what? But I fell in love with it. And mm. you were Cosette basically. I, yes. <laughs> and Eponine. I was and just, Eponine too. and yeah. my friends, my friend's little sister actually played Cosette on the Broadway version, young Cosette um, mm -hmm. for years. So we, that was super, just a super cool experience. Musical theater really touched me, um, which makes a lot of sense now because the way that that music is kind of built is a lot more similar to how worship music was built. So when I left Mormon hymns and went to worship music, it was like, oh, this is what I've been missing. <laughs> this is this is amazing. So yeah, I loved all of that Broadway and everything. Okay. What brought your family to Utah? 
My dad's job was either going to move him back to the Maryland, D.C. area, or we've always had an opportunity for him to join a firm here. So he kind of just took that as an opportunity to be back with family. And all my extended family was still either here or in California, but mainly here. And so he was like, I guess it's time to just be back with family. So that's when we moved. So where'd you move here in Utah? We moved to Cottonwood Heights, and we've been there ever since. They're still in the same house. Okay. Yeah. So what high school? Is that Brighton? Or? Brighton, yes. You went, went to Brighton, Brighton High? Yep. You're a Bengal. I was a Bengal, <laughs> okay. yeah. Okay. So what was what was it like like growing up back east, living in freaking Cambridge or, or right. Manhattan, and then your sophomore year of high school? And by the way, I grew up outside of Utah as a Mormon, so I— Right. I, I, I'm already relating to what you're, what, what's about to happen. Right. I know. <laughs> you're coming to, you're coming to Oz. It's basically Dorothy in yes. your mind. Yes. It's Dorothy coming to Oz, right? Absolutely. I mean, <laughs> yeah. What, just in the context of being around, just <laughs> being in Zion, I was, I was really like, okay, these are going to be my people. Now I will say I absolutely hated the move, but that had nothing to do with the fact that we were coming to Utah and everything to do with just what I was leaving there. I was leaving a boyfriend and my opportunities in sports and with the musicals. I just hated everything I was leaving. But with that said, I was excited to be around family and I was like, wow, there's going to be more Mormons. That's going to be pretty cool. And then the culture shock just slapped me in the face. And it was just, it was, I don't even know how to describe it verbally other than just explaining what the experience was that unfolded. I mean, I, I went from being able to say that Mormonism is my full-blown identity and this is why I do the things that I do to now being around every single person around me also being Mormon and they're all not doing the same things the same way that I was. So I couldn't then use Mormonism as an excuse to not drink or not curse or like anything that I had as a, as a goal in life of who I wanted to marry. I mean, nothing was unique anymore. I was 0% unique at this point. And everything that I had used to be unique in New York was just gone. So I did not know who I was at this point. And I very, very early on, like sophomore year of high school, started partying um, because I was just trying to find an escape because I'm like, Okay, all these people are saying that they're Mormon too, but they're pr pretty either pretty judgmental here or they're doing this and that that doesn't follow doesn't doesn't compute with what I've been taught. It was so confusing. So I just decided, well, you know what? Screw it. I'm just going to do whatever I want now, and I don't even think I knew what that was at the time because I'm a teenager, but um I kind of gave way to pretty much everything you could possibly think of in high school at that point. So I guess, I guess growing up in, in Houston, there were kid, Mormon kids that broke the rules, but I think, you know, there were a bunch of us that didn't. And then I think we just looked at them as like being sinners, right? It, I, I've never understood. And I would hear about Utah culture how the Utah kids didn't take the standards as seriously. The Utah Mormons didn't, Utah Mormon high schoolers didn't take the standards as seriously as the Mormons who lived outside of Utah. Right. But I never got that mentality. Like I never, I, I've always wanted to just ask a kid raised, how, you're Mormon still, like they're still your standards. How can there be a high school culture of Mormons partying in mass? It just didn't make sense. No, me. it didn't. It didn't make sense. It didn't make sense to me at all. I mean, and I don't know if it was just where I was in New York, but oh, no. my oh, my okay. ward in New York, I don't know of anybody in my age range who was a sinner of sorts. So we all like had each other. And then I come here and I'm like, I don't even know who to who to turn to, who to talk to about this type of thing. Nothing special. And these Mormon kids are the ones giving me crap for not doing A, B, or C. They're pressuring so you. They're, they're peer the peer pressure. pressure. Yeah, they're the peer pressures. And like on Sunday, what are they doing at church? Like They're going to McDonald's during second the second hour and like stuff like that. But so are they like, are the boys still passing the sacrament? The boys are still the sacrament? Absolutely. So it's, there would be it's total hypocrisy. Like 
Totally. Yeah. The, the, the older brothers of my friends in New York who were passing the sacrament, they, for my, for my knowledge, were also the ones standing up against like bullying and like bad behavior at school. So it all aligned. And then here I come to Utah and I'm like, there would be boys who would be like really sexually inappropriate towards me in the hallway. I mean, just like grabbing parts of people's bodies, like all the time, who would then go bless the sacrament on Sunday. And the whole, there was just a lot of cognitive dissonance going on in my brain at that point of just like none of this really adds up. So why am I even, why am I following these rules that are seemingly boring to me as a kid? Why am I doing that? If it's not even what the majority is doing, does that mean that it's not true? Like I started slightly questioning stuff in, in high school, not to a deep degree though, at all. Like I could imagine like sophomore me, if, if we had moved to Utah, like, just like, having this moment where I just turned as many Mormon kids in the cafeteria as I could and just saying, what the freak, everyone? Why aren't you guys living the standards? Yeah. Like, did you ever like ask around? Like, why are you all like disobeying the prophet? Did you ever, <laughs> or was that just, you didn't do that? Like, I didn't do that because I was so in shock. I think I was just so disturbed <laughs> by what I was experiencing. And at that point I was kind of just in this rebellious mindset of just like, Oh, well, if that's how this is going to go down and that's how people operate, then all right. Didn't give it too much thought after that. And just went and found like a crowd that I felt comfortable with. That was not Mormon. The friends that I ended up actually becoming friends with in high school were not Mormon. They were like the three people who weren't Mormon. Cause that's where I felt most comfortable. I felt most comfortable around people who weren't telling me, weren't preaching to me and in the same sense doing the exact opposite of what they're preaching. That I could not get get by. And I had a lot of boyfriends who were preparing for their missions who would do very similar things, who would break the rules, the rules that they wanted to break and kind of like judge me in the sense of rules that had to do with the word of wisdom, but then they would be totally fine breaking the law of chastity without thinking about it. So, so they judge you for breaking the word of wisdom while they were comfortable breaking the law of chastity. Yeah. Yeah. That's all weird. The other <laughs> thing is like so much of my identity was like not violating the law of chastity and not violating the word of wisdom. Like to this day, I still haven't tried beer. I'm 52 right. Right. and like Mormon Voldemort. And I, it's still <laughs> so much of my identity. Like I'm trying to imagine if there's any scenario where if I had moved to Utah, if I would have let that go from peer pressure? And if so, if there would have been this sad moment of like saying goodbye to my standards type of thing, and I'm not trying to make you feel judged or sad. I'm just wondering sure. if there was any part of you that felt sad to let that go. Cause it's, for me, it's, it was a matter of pride for, it still is probably in some level. Yeah. To my knowledge and memory, I do not remember being, sad about letting those things go. I was more so sad at my surroundings and the reality that I was stepping into. So I wasn't necessarily sad that I had now made these decisions that I had vowed never to make. I was more sad at the fact that what I thought was my reality really wasn't when it came down to being surrounded by by people of the same faith. It was just not what I expected at all. So I was more sad at the disappointment that I felt for the community at large versus just what I did or the people around me did specifically. You're kind of disillusioned. Yeah. But by, by, at, by, at Mormons. Yeah. That yeah. they really weren't what you thought. Yeah, because my I was embarrassed, actually. I remember feeling embarrassed because in New York, I, I really, I mean, I remember we had a project where we had to put one statement on a license plate. And the statement could be as long as you wanted, not like however many characters on a license plate. But what, what was that statement going to be? And I remember... <laughs> Mine was, you wish you were Mormon. And <laughs> I look back on that now and I'm like, my teachers probably thought that was the most, like, God bless them. They probably thought that was the most ridiculous thing uh, coming from like a now understanding Catholicism <laughs> mindset, and like Jewish mindset, like what they were thinking. I, they did a good job at making me feel like, like, um, good for you. seen, but good for I was you, really Rachel. like, good I know you. I was a warrior for God, but, <laughs> but, um, I remember feeling embarrassed to the extent that I went to defend Mormonism as a New Yorker Mormon. 
to only find that the things that they were saying about Mormons that they had heard was actually true. Like I would get questioned about things all the time. Like, well, of course they'd go polygamy route and things like that. And I could kind of denounce those things easily. But when it came to like, oh, I met a Mormon and, and they did this or said that, I would just not even believe their story. I would be like, no, a Mormon wouldn't do that. And then to move here, (laughs) I'm like, I've been defending you guys for so long. (laughs) Exactly. I suck right now. Like, (laughs) what is happening? So that to me, I remember feeling very humiliated to like a deep degree to where I just Mm. wanted to kind of like, I didn't want. That's it all. I didn't want any part of it at that mm. point. I became pretty inactive at, other than have, being forced to go while I was still in high school at under 18. I still went to mm. church, but I was pretty inactive from sophomore year till right before I dated the guy that I married. Yeah. So that's kind of just like, it's kind of like a loss of innocence. It's kind of yeah. like a, a, a disillusionment and a loss of innocence. Jen, I was going to ask you, like you were raised in Utah mm-hmm. and you raised your kids in Utah. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't understand how, you know, I I guess on the one hand, we cover a lot on this podcast about hypocrisy and, you know, dual lives of the hidden life and then the public face and how, in some sense, the church kind of teaches you to be honest, but also maybe unintentionally teaches you to lie a lot. Mm -hmm. What, what, do you have any insight on this kind of, long established Mormon, Utah Mormon culture of Mormon kids kind of living double lives? Like how, how, I know it's a weird question. Well, for me, um, I had a really good group of friends. So for me, you weren't pressured like her, uh -uh. like Rachel? (laughs) No, I actually only remember going. What was your high school again? Alta. Okay. Sandy. Uh Okay. Yeah. Um, I actually only remember two, two parties that I went to where something was there or was offered to me. And it, and it was from like the bad kids, you know, that I knew, (laughs) you know, the heathens (laughs) that I knew were kind of the, they, they were Mormon, but I knew they weren't living their standards. And so I was, I kind of had a little bubble of friends. So me myself growing up, I I would I would say all my friends were doing what they were supposed to do mm. and living the standards that they said that they were okay. going to learn, learn or live. So, so Rachel's experience wasn't yours. No, it mm. wasn't. Okay. It wasn't, but um I do know that there was that group within my high school who would have been the same. Yeah. You know, um, but so I, there, there was another group that weren't my close friends, but, um, so I could see definitely if someone kind of came in and were befriended by that certain group that they would have that experience for sure. What about in your kid's high school experience? Do you think they would have had more like Rachel or more like yours? Um, just with Mormon kids partying, but then blessed and passing the sacrament on Sunday kind of thing. Um, I think their age was a step further in that direction. Towards Rachel's uh-huh. direction. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I guess it's always going to depend on what high school and what group you fall into. And, yeah. And yeah. Anyway. Yeah. And I didn't really, I mean, I didn't go out seeking, you know, certain groups. It's kind of just like I got involved in no. sports and in theater and it's like mm-hmm. f- whoever was involved yeah. in that. Well, it's theater like, kids now. Oh my gosh. Well, <laughs> I was not in that for very long. The theater mindset in uh, New York is very different from Utah. And when I came to Utah, I was like, so this is where they got the narrative for High School Musical. Okay. The <laughs> thespian narrative. Like it was very different back then back then. But yeah, I was more involved in sports in high school and just kind of became friends with, with that crowd. And yeah, I must say that though, that I have, I have always in my whole life heard, heard that, that there's a Utah Mormon and then there's a outside Utah Mormon. Yeah. And there's a different culture, a different mindset and, and everything. So I've, I have always heard that even in my kids and myself. Yeah. Well, I think people, People who grow up in Utah Mormon, I can't imagine how confusing that must be when most people around you are Mormon because then you're you're 
more susceptible to having at least some of them believe deeper or less deep degrees of Mormonism. Mm -hmm. So whereas like in New York, my ward was so small, all of us kind of seemed to be at the same like level of um, belief system when it came to how deeply we were embedded in theology. But you come here and you have you have more chances of running into somebody who's like looked into the history more Mm -hmm. or who has been uh, brought up in a certain environment where they're learning about all of these things that a New York Mormon wouldn't learn about. And you kind of, you, you hear more about Mormonism, the good and the bad here. And I feel like that would bring a lot of confusion to a lot of people. Whereas our small ward was just very like, okay, we're all in the same boat. Check, check. All right, let's roll. Do you feel like um, outside of Utah as a Mormon, you had less shame put onto you than here in Utah? Yes. Yeah, because outside of Utah, especially in New York, you have so many different religions that are kind of falling into this melting pot that the respect that people have for other people's religion is very, very high. And um, they don't really need to know everything about your religion. They don't, they can know something that I would deem now as weird and they don't, they don't kind of give you crap about that or anything. They're just like, oh, okay, that's something that you guys do. That's cool. And there was a lot more people more intrigued about Mormonism growing up in New York um, versus, yeah, here I see a lot of criticism towards it because it's, 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 we're saturated with it here. But there was a very high level of respect from other people to my family for the fact that we were Mormon. Mm-hmm. And what about with, within the religion? Just like, like leaders, from shame. leaders or from other, yeah, basically from leaders, leaders shaming within the, youth. the Mormon church. Yeah, shaming the youth or making them feel less than. Did you feel that in New York or, or here? Um, um, for like Mormon leaders making non-Mormons feel less than or the Mormons? Mormons. Um, I noticed definitely more shame in Utah. With that, you mean I, like if a if a youth breaks the law of chastity or breaks the word of wisdom, kind of thing? Yeah, or just doesn't go to seminary. Like it doesn't have to be something huge, you know. Okay. Um, okay. You know. Okay. Just Le- like, yeah. shame on you. Yeah. 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 No, there was definitely more grace from what I remember from East Coast bishops and leaders because they're used to seeing so many things from people who are converts. They're used to more converts. So they're used to giving this grace period for people. If you're like not at the point of going to seminary all the time or not this, that with bishops here, it's almost like the sense of, you know, better, like we're all around to hold you accountable. You're surrounded by Mormons everywhere you go. Like, you know, better, this shouldn't be happening. Mm -hmm. Whereas there, there's way more of a grace period because I think of the, uh, the, the increase in, in converts and people with much different backgrounds. Oftentimes outside of Utah, it's just like, we're just glad you're here, you know? Yeah. Yeah, (laughs) totally. (laughs) Which should be yeah. Awesome. Yeah, <laughs> you know right. what I mean? Which I think yeah. is good. Yeah, yeah. 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 That should be the feeling when someone comes to church. Right. We're so glad you're here. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. You know? Yeah. But. I have to ask if the name Austin Archer means anything to you. It does not. So Austin Archer, we've had a Mormon stories. He's got like a million TikTok followers. Oh, okay. And he went to Brighton and was in theater. And I imagine he's oh, a little really? bit older than you. Yeah, I mean, I I graduated in eleven. I'll be thirty this year. I'm not He's sure how be old. Similar? Are we at similar age? No, I don't know. I mean, I really, when it comes to theater, I was in theater for like two seconds, and then I was okay. like, mm. you dropped out. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. But okay, so um, so when you kind of like became a, a bad girl, did you think of yourself as a bad girl? Like, I don't mean to even put those words together, but like. As soon as you started breaking the church's standards as a high schooler, stop taking it seriously. Where you see you were still attending church, right? Yep. So, so what was that cognitive dissonance like, and how did you manage it? Yeah, um, I definitely felt like the the black sheep, the bad girl. I got a lot of judgment from certain groups at school, um, but. <sighs> I I went to church and I just remember caring a lot growing up about my parents' friends and what they thought of me and just 
authority in general, like even teachers and what they thought of me, I always wanted to come across as um, the respectful one. And I dealt with a lot of cognitive dissonance there because I was kind of being told that these things that I'm doing that have nothing to do with whether I'm a kind, compassionate, respectful human, I was now doing all these things that were deemed so sinful and so bad, just like drinking and stuff, um, that I was really... It was really important to me that my friends' parents and my teachers didn't know that side. So I remember feeling like this double life, living this double life, because I'd be just on it in this this churchgoer for in one part of the week, and then in other parts of the week, it'd be completely different, and I'd be like totally in my mind hating on the church. I was never really vocal about my um, dislike for the church back then. I was still pretty respectful, but I just didn't... I did receive a lot of judgment um, from from other people who were my peers, and I didn't want that same judgment coming from grown-ups. How did you hide it? How did you hide the word getting around kind of thing? Um, I just stuck with a very specific friend group who most of them weren't Mormon, so I knew it wasn't going to creep back into um, the ward and the friends that I had at the ward. I was not friends outside of church. I was not friends with my ward friends. Mm. They were great friends, and I think they're great people. Um, We just did not hang out outside of church. I kept it very separate. Did your family know you were goofing around? Totally, yeah. My I was grounded <laughs> majority of my high school life, from what I can remember, and uh, I was I mean I was the guinea pig, you know, being the oldest. I was mm. I'm still probably considered the black sheep, but um, my parents definitely knew that I was that I was partying and and stuff like that. They were not happy about it, but I think they were more so concerned with very practical things, and that was not communicated to me. To me, it was communicated like, we're upset because this is going against the church, but what they meant by it now, having talked to them about it now, was, no, we just didn't want you to you know, drink because we didn't want you to drink and drive at 17. Like, totally understandable things for a parent to worry about. Like unwed pregnancy kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, an unwed pregnancy, and they were, like, really worried about all those things, naturally and understandably so. Um, but I definitely always thought, in my mind, that it had to do with the church and that the only reason why these things were bad or that people were worried is because of the church. So I just tried to keep it as hidden as possible. But my parents, they did know and and it, things would get around the ward occasionally, but not like to a deep degree. I still remember by the time I left Mormonism, it was like I was I was in close contact and, and in good relationship with pretty much everyone at my ward. How did you manage your bishop and your leaders who would have been interviewing you about your worthiness throughout your high school years? Well, I did go through moments where I would go and confess to the bishop myself because I would feel guilty about certain things. And um, I remember sitting in multiple confessions and they handled it well from what I remember. There was no like severe repercussions Um, so as far as like the way that they handled it, obviously I couldn't take the sacrament for certain periods of time. That was embarrassing, but, and now looking back, I, I, I thought for a long time, oh, my bishops handled this really well. They never, my bishops were never inappropriate. They never said anything bad in hindsight, looking at how they actually phrased certain questions in those meetings, it, it wasn't okay how they handled it, but I don't think that they even realized. Do you mean asking sexually explicit questions? Like the bishop alone with you, 16 years old, behind closed doors? Yeah, yeah, like asking if I would confess to something and then the response would be, okay, and did... Did, was it enjoyable and things like that. So, and at the time, even now looking at who those people were, I'm like, I don't think they even knew what they were even doing or saying. It was kind of just regurgitating what you're taught in some handbook or something. So they they didn't seem to even think through what they were saying. And at the time, I don't remember that specifically being like traumatic back then, but it was awkward at best and humiliating. And um, But I would go back and forth between wanting to confess and then wanting to hide and shame. Um, but I, I definitely felt like even when I was inactive, that the Mormon church was true and I was just wrong. So 
I knew that at some point or thought that at some point I was going to have to come back to the fold. And I was really wrestling with how I was going to do that. It's kind of Jack Mormon vibes a yeah. little bit. Yeah. Is there a female equivalent to Jack Mormon? Jane not that, Mormon? Not Jane that I Mormon. know of. No. <laughs> we'll just that make that up of, now. But we can Mormons, now it's started. It, yeah. Mormons don't Jane care Mormon. enough. To, Mormons don't care enough about women to even, yeah, to even have a Jack Mormon us. equivalent. Yeah. That's <laughs> exactly. rude. I don't mean to be rude, but we, Mormons need to create more female names. The Book of Mormon yes. needs to get more female names. Like <laughs> Women aren't named in Mormonism. Uh, They're kind of ignored. Jane Not Mormon. Mean we rude. just started You were Jane Mormon. <laughs> Jane Mormon? Does that work? That works for me. doesn't have the same ring, though. It Jane, doesn't. It doesn't. No. But I was a total Jack. Yeah. <laughs> so um, how did you navigate feelings of guilt with your heavenly father, prayer, that sort of thing? Um, I always actually had a very deep prayer life that was unique to even my siblings who went on missions, who, who never were inactive growing up. Um, they even remember my whole upbringing being like, you, you always were like really close with God specifically. And I don't know where that came from. I always had this deep prayer life, but when it came to wrestling with guilt, I just knew I was like, God knows if God knows my heart, then God knows like where I'm actually struggling. And I don't need to explain that to him because he already knows all of those things. So why am I having to explain it to all these people like my bishop or, or a friend at school or something like that? I was really... Um, not down for people adding on more shame to me than I already felt myself because I was very hard on myself. I didn't need God to make it harder for me or other people. I was really close with prayer life. I don't remember ever feeling shame in the sense of heavenly fathers upset with me. I remember feeling shame in the sense of my parents are mad and my, my school buddies found out about this and things like that. It was very like surface level kind of what I was afraid of. So your perception of your heavenly father at the time was unconditional love yeah. and support. Yeah. That's nice. Yeah, it was nice. It honestly saved me in certain periods of time in college when I was like heavily partying in the frat scene. Um, I remember being show wasted in the back alley of some parking lot and looking up at the stars <laughs> What was and that praying. word? Wasted? What was I just say shwasted. <laughs> <laughs> Is that a, I, that's a different form of being wasted. That's it's like just really like wasted. a mixture of, you know, <laughs> hammered and wasted and <laughs> first, I don't know. I'll try, I'll try not to curse. I'm trying so hard not to curse over here, guys. Okay. <laughs> but um, I, yeah, I... You were in an alley. I was in an alleyway and I was, I was really hammered and I was praying. <laughs> I was praying like, God, I know you're up there. And if you are, I just need you to throw me a Hail Mary of sorts because I'm drowning over here. And I really, really need some help. And that same year, I kind of like picked myself up off, off the streets of that season of life and then became active again in the church after that due to the guy that I ended up marrying. Um, so to me, that felt like an answered prayer. In hindsight, I, I would have more to say about it. But at that time, it was like, oh, I just I threw one up to God and he was totally there and provided what I needed. I want to get to that, but I, I don't want to miss anything. Did you so did you did you do seminary in high school in New York? early in the morning because we did not have it, um, you know, attached yeah. to our school or anything. So I remember getting up three days a week early in the morning to do it freshman year. I did have to do it um, when I went to school here at Brighton, but I skipped a lot. And it was kind of something where my vice principal actually told me my senior year, I had a lot of detentions for skipping. And he's like, all right, if you just go to seminary and not miss any more seminary classes, I'll take away all of your detentions. What? Yeah. That's and now like, I'm looking at like that like, coercion. what? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. But I totally, of course, didn't see it as that at that point. And I was going, wait, so you're saying I have to go to like the, e I have to attend the easiest class there is to like remove all my detentions. Like you got it. Like I was all in for that. Mm -hmm. So I totally did that. Now I'm like, Ooh, that was, that sh could have been a fireable offense for mm -hmm. him probably. So as you're finishing high school, like w were you, were you pursuing academics? Were you pursuing 
uh, talents? Were you just like lost? How would you describe <laughs> kind of like the culminating senior year in your graduation? I was just trying to get through it. I was trying to get through it and I knew I wanted to go to the U because that was like, we're, we're huge Utes fans from the time, even when we lived in the East Coast because of my parents. And um, I was excited to do that. And I was just excited to be done with high school. I was just like done with done with this. I wanted to be an adult as fast as possible. I wanted to be an adult and be out of the house. And, um, and yeah, I mean, I wrapped up high school. Senior year was great. I was in a really, I was in my first like real loving relationship, if you will. And we were kind of both on the same wavelength with church. We both were raised Mormon. His family was, was pretty active. My family was pretty active and we were the oldest and both the black sheep. So we were both kind of like, all right, well, let's, we'll just figure this out together. And it just felt comfortable. And, um, I was in a good relationship with my parents and, and my whole family and was still going to church cause I had to, but, um, yeah, I just kind of wrote out high school just to get through it. I had no no big events or big plans that took place. Anything else about your Mormon story before college that you want to make sure you mention before we jump to college? Nope. I think, uh, I think, I mean, I was pretty, yeah, I was pretty inactive in high school. I mean, had to go to Trek and dress up, you know, pioneer days. And that was hilarious because I was totally inactive at that point And everyone in the ward knew that. But here I am dressed like a pioneer trekking through the through the fields. And that was hilarious. Other than that, I remember like events like that. I would just go and, and we'd we'd make the most of it. But I didn't really buy into anything I was doing. Um, but no, I mean, I was pretty much moderately an active Jack Mormon for for the remainder of high school. OK. OK, so you go to the U. Yep. And the you joined a sorority or. Yep. I joined Delta Gamma. At the U, and I did that because at the time, as did a you freshman, rush? You yeah, I rushed as a freshman, and at the time, the U was way more of a commuter school than it is now, and it still is, but it was very heavily commuter school. So the only way to make to meet people was a s Greek row or a sport or joining student body. So I joined the sororities, and that entered into, I would say, my first rock bottom in my whole life was that first two years of what college. What was you sorority like for you? So you sorority life like for you? I got a taste of it when I was a counselor in the counseling center at Utah state. Mm -hmm. There was a lot, there were a lot of, there was a lot of alcohol and drug abuse. There was a lot of real extreme sexual kind of things. And there was high eating disorder kind of things going on. That, that yeah. was my, that's what I gleaned from the, students I counseled with? Yeah. Um, I was, so right out the gate, I was like, all right, cool. I'm going to meet some friends. This is great. But I really did not buy into this whole, like, like the cult mindset of it. Cause it totally is within itself, like its own little cult. You buy into like this, this thing that everybody has in common of just whatever your theme is for your sorority. And then everything is all about that. And I don't even really remember what ours was, but, um, I remember very quickly now having access to anything that I wanted really in terms of alcohol and drugs and being away from my parents more at this point, I just kind of took advantage and went nuts with that. Like I was just self-medicate. I was self-medicating for sure because I was dealing with a lot of depression and not really sure who I was at that point. And um, I remember just being wanting to be at every single party. I had FOMO if I wasn't there. I was just always involved with whatever was going on. Um, but very quickly, I started realizing that it was not a safe space to be if you ever passed a certain point of intoxicated. If you ever passed a certain point, you now as a woman were no longer in a safe space. Like sexual assault kind of stuff? Yeah. And there were many, many occasions where I was sexually assaulted in the frat houses and I remember my parents and I getting in some big fight that ended up me be, like leaving the house and um, I couldn't take anything with me. So the only place I had to go at that point was Greek Row. So I ended up showing up there and I for a couple months I had to basically decide, OK, am I going to sleep on this back alleyway? on the street in a sleeping bag that's kind of by the garage of the house so that I kind of feel safe? 
or am I going to go sleep in the fraternity house and potentially wake up with something bad having happened that night? And I kind of, it was like a coin toss every night for a couple months. And, um, they were were homeless from your home in Cottonwood Heights. Yes. Because your parents were mad at you for, because we had gotten in some, we had got, yeah, we had gotten in some blowout fight that I don't even honestly don't even remember what that was for, but we didn't speak for a couple months. But you didn't live in the sorority house then. No, I was not one of the people who paid the extra to stay in the house. Um, they did let me stay there for a certain period of time, but there were girls who didn't know the extent of the situation who were pretty judgmental about me being around a lot. So I would, I didn't want to be around there. Um, I didn't want to be around those girls. So I was either kind of like on the street or at a frat house, or if my boyfriend and I were in good terms for that period of time at his apartment, something like that. But he was also in a frat and kind of going through the same rock bottom at the same time. So we were both just a hot mess at the same time. Um, but I couldn't really decide like what was, what I would, what I was risking when I would stay in the frat houses. It was, I didn't realize how bad it was honestly till years later. And now I look back and I'm like, okay, I'm trying to put words to what actually took place. And it's just so uncomfortable because my whole life, you know, growing up Mormon, we did not talk about sexual assault. We did not talk about things like that. So I didn't even know how to verbalize that that was going on to anybody at that point. Mm. Yeah. I'm sure there's a lot of frat boys that are like, sure, you can stay here. You yeah. Know what I mean, Ugh. yeah, sure. You could stay here. And then the next morning it'd be like, my bottoms would be like, not in the same position mm. that they were the mm. night before. So it's like things like that. Um, would take place. That's like the minor version of the stories, but, um, yeah, it was just, it was just really bad. It got really bad to the point where I didn't want to live anymore. And that was my first suicide attempt was in the frat scene mm, at so the U. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. It was, um, I mean, you know, I've of course made decisions too, that I would take back in an instant that just were just dumb decisions that put myself in a situation for harm to take place. And I wish I could, you know, go back and change those things. But at the end of the day, there were just, yeah, some really bad things that I was not prepared for that took place. And, and I didn't want to be around them. And it wasn't until after that suicide attempt that I finally like came back home. And my, my dad literally picked me up from a frat house and dropped me, brought me home once he realized how serious it was. I'm so sorry. Yeah, it was, this is the first time I've uh, talked about that publicly. <laughs> so this is, um, yeah, it's, it, it was, it was crazy. It was a crazy time. So it's not knowing who you are. It's depression. It's substance use and abuse. Mm -hmm. It's sexual assaults. It's yeah. just all of that and just feeling lost and dark. Yeah. Just feeling that. And I think there was a degree looking back on it that was really big and, uh, in, in, that, that was really big in correlation to my faith loss. I mean, I really had no idea who I was from the time we moved to Utah to this point. And it had been like four years and I still was like struggling with that same thing. And I didn't have anybody to talk to about it because my whole family was still in the church. And, um, and I th still thought that I was the one in the wrong because I was partying. So I must be the sinner in the situation. Um, so I never looked into like anything after that. I just kind of took it as I'm wrong. I'm making these mistakes. Therefore, my life is str a struggle right now. And I'm doing this to myself. And so I might as well make it easier for me and everyone around me and just end it. And that, and then that's, yeah, that's what led to the attempt. I'm so sorry. Um, I have a couple questions. Like you, when, when I think about a Jack Mormon, for those who don't know what that term is, it's somebody right. who kind of still believes, but they're just not obeying and, and they're inactive, not going to church and then breaking the rules. Mm -hmm. So on the one hand, you kind of alluded to losing your faith as a sophomore. Once you found out that Utah Mormons were kind of not really as committed as you thought and you got disillusioned. So it, it, it sounds like there was, there was some conflicting 
beliefs there that, that are, at some level you weren't totally bought into the church as a belief system anymore, but on some level you still were hanging on to your beliefs. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. I didn't really have the, the, the mindset to be able to think, Oh, why don't I just look into what I actually believe to be able to have more of a firm foundation on what I'm standing on. I didn't even th- get to the point of thinking that far. I just took what I had received growing up and took that as ultimate literal truth and had no reason to question it and thought that everything bad that was happening happening to me was because I was making poor decisions. And to a certain extent that was true, but I didn't think like, Oh, what I've, what I'm believing isn't, true or something like that. Like, let me look into it further. And then I'd be able to come to a conclusion of sorts that may have brought me peace. I wasn't even at that point. I was just kind of like all these people who are, who have told me these things my whole life that are true are way smarter people than I am. Like that's, that's where it would go. It would just go to, I'm not intelligent enough to be able to make these decisions and come to these conclusions that A, B, or C isn't true or is true. I'm just going to trust the the prophets and the historians and the whatever, um, and, and believe what they're saying. And if it's not, if it's, if I have a problem with it, it's because I'm the issue. And that's the, that's the furthest extent it would go at that point. But there was a degree it felt wrong. It felt off the, the church's truthfulness felt off, right? Yeah. Yeah. It felt off, but I couldn't even pinpoint what that was in regards to theology or doctrine. Cause for me, it was very cultural. It was like, it feels off because these people feel exceptionally judgmental when that's exactly what I've been told not to be. And that's who the Mormon, the New York Mormons didn't seem like that. So it was just kind of like, it was very, it started all cultural. Hmm. It didn't get theological till, till later. You but lost your cultural testimony. I lost my cultural testimony. Hmm. Yes. Okay. One more question. And this is, this is more of a reflection. As I'm thinking about like the role the church played for me is it got me through college with straight A's and like no huge mistakes and no addictions just like, and then ready for the, um, ready for the, you know, job, ready for the job market. I'm married. I've got kids. It gave me focus. It gave me meaning. It gave me purpose. It gave me standards. Mm -hmm. And you know, within a few years, I'm making six figures out of college. Like the, the, the only downside of that is it, for me, it wasn't true, but it was such a great structure. Yeah. And I'm just thinking about how easy it is. Well, and, and not all Mormons follow that structure. So I acknowledge that like, you know, there's a certain percentage that don't, but I'm just like, it's so frustrating that like, sometimes if you aren't given a structure, even if it's false, if you're not given a structure, you're left to figure it all out. And then you're kind of left to the wolves and yeah. it's frustrating. It's so frustrating. I was talking about this with my brother-in-law the other day of how beneficial it is to be born into this idea that at least your faith is the ultimate truth. You've made it in that regard because then all the brain power that everybody else has to use to kind of figure out existential questions, you now can take that energy and put it into your career moves and what you want with your family. And you can, yeah, it could be more linear and self-improvement. You don't have to expend all this energy um, trying to figure out all these big life questions because they've already all the answers have already been given to you. So now I'm kind of stepping into this like existential crisis of sorts where I'm like, this takes a lot of energy to just and research and time to figure out what's actually true or what do I want to land on as truth or belief. And I didn't have to worry about that before. I could just focus on other things that were specific to what I wanted to accomplish in life. Because I wasn't hit by all these existential questions all the time. Because when I'm thinking about my own children, that we all left the church by the time my oldest was like a you know senior in high school. So many of my kids have just had to, you know, we do our best to provide examples and to, to provide moral reasoning and to provide right. encouragement and emotional support. But they're all just trying to find their way, and whether it's with alcohol, drugs, sex 
school identity, sexual gender identity. It's I just I I look at them and I just think, man, I I don't like in some ways I envy them that they weren't raised in a high demand religion slash cult. Yeah. And I think, well, that they should be grateful that they weren't raised in a, you know, to be set up for a disillusionment like I was. But then I'm like, but man, they've had it way rougher than I had it. And they're awesome. I'm not saying they're not awesome. Right. But it's it's just, I just, I'm always frustrated by how easy it is to get lost when you don't have that iron rod to hold on to, even if the iron rod is not true. I hate it. I know. I know. So I'm feeling for you. And it's, I'm frustrated with life. I know. I'm so frustrated. It's so much, it's so much to think about. And it's so exhausting and it's liberating at the same time. There is this sense of freedom that I feel right now with having this permission that I've given myself to know that I can come to terms on my own with what I believe through just basic research and things like that. But and my and through my experience. But oh my gosh, yeah. I mean, my my siblings who have two young daughters right now, they just left the Mormon church and they're looking at their two-year-old and their six-month-old going, okay, do? how are we going to do this? Because they don't have, when you grow up in a church, in a high demand religion, you kind of, as a parent, I would imagine, be at least able to, to give the parenting away to the community. Like it takes a village, right? So it's like, if you trust the village that you're in, then you're getting a lot of help with parenting. You're getting a heck of a lot of help from all angles. And now they're looking at their kids going, we have to do this ourselves, like just by ourselves, because we're not going to let our kids be indoctrinated into things that like, in their opinion, isn't true. So it's a lot more work as a parent and an individual to just live and 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 find things that are true on your own and just being able to take in other people's experiences as truth and really sit with that and sit with the pain of other people and and that pain may have been caused by your religion and that's hard to 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 deal with and so it's like hearing people's experiences just for what they are and really understanding how to research what truth is to a certain degree. It's it's a lot and it's liberating and it's frustrating and it's all the things all at once. Yeah. And it's just and you're, heavy. And um, the plan within the church as a woman would be different than the plan that was given to John. Yes. For, yeah. you know, for his life. Yeah, worse. Yeah, John. Mm -hmm. John's plan, well, yeah, you're given a plan like, you know, you go to college, you know, you get that degree. What you, career do you want? Yeah, Follow what career do you want? Yeah. yeah, pick and choose that one. <laughs> what would you like to do with that? You know, Sky's it's a very, it's a very more healthy plan that yeah. the church gives Mel. Yeah. Mel's oh my within the church absolutely yeah no my sister is in that right now and i dealt with this too when i was married and we'll get into that but i dealt with that too because we kind of sacrificed everything for his career and so with my sister she's like i love my daughters and would never take them back however i only had children at this age she's getting her master's right now so all of that combined with toddlers is really difficult She's like, I would not be dealing with all of this at once had I not been raised Mormon because I had to put building a family over everything. So I'm still, she's still been in the mindset of she wants her own career, which is rare for, for a woman, a Mormon woman in general to think that way. But she's been able to think that way and also still go, this kind of sucks because I could have done the career path first and then chose to have kids. But because I wasn't told that that was the highest value, of importance in life and a t eternal value that I had to, um, I felt like I had just had to have kids at the same time. I had to, at least if I'm going to have a career, I have to at least have kids at the same time. There was no putting yeah. the kids on the back burner as an option. And of course she'd never take it back, but it, I'm watching it in real time happen. And it's like so exhausting and devastating for, yeah, it's hard. Cause it's a, not just your religion that you, you lose, um, it's your identity yeah. as a woman when you have a faith crisis yeah. because your, your plan or what you were given, um, you know, was not the same, you know, you weren't given an education and, you know, a career path and, um, to find value in that. And, um, that can 
help in a way in the process, I think, in a faith crisis to have that established and have something else to like have. (laughs) Right. And when you don't have that extra part, it's almost like your whole identity crashes with your faith crisis, at least for me. Yeah. And for other women that I've talked to, it seems that way. You yeah. Know, it, it, it's a huge, it's a huge identity crisis to mm. such a deep degree that I have to call, I have to like, somebody has got to hold me back every time I'm in a conversation where mm-hmm. somebody is grossly oversimplifying deconstruction and just what mm-hmm. that's like in general, mm-hmm. because they want to throw this out like that. Oh, the people who deconstruct or the people who think differently about this or, are Born like the sin or never believed exactly or, you know, they're we're never, offended or right yeah they they just oversimplify it to the deepest degree and i'm sitting here as myself and a lot of my family members going like we believe to such a deep degree and that's why this is such a painful experience mm-hmm. and for that not to be seen by the general public or you know people still of the faith is 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 sad to me because I feel like if it could be just seen and understood and acknowledged as real pain, we could have healing conversations with members who are still believers. And but there is this like nobody wants to do that because no one wants their pain to go unacknowledged. We've already been there for so long that yeah. we're not going to risk that again. We're not going to yeah. get into conversations like that again because mm-hmm. it's there's just too much to unfold. So then we gravitate towards other people who have deconstructed and other people who are already X mm-hmm. well or X this, X that mm-hmm. because we just, we get it. We're not going to be, our pain's not going to be diminished anymore. Yeah. yeah. I think for a lot of them, it's hard to hold space for emotion mm-hmm. and empathy at the same time. Um, I think a lot of people um, see that as weakness. Um, And so, or um, it's just uncomfortable for them to to be in that space with someone in that. um, And they need to, you know, I don't label it or withdraw from it. Yeah. Um, And it's just hard for them. And um, I think if more people could sit in that empathy, and sit in that emotion, not not feeling that the emotion is bad in any way. Right. Um, there'd be a, a lot more peace and a lot more love in the transition. Yeah. In faith transi- transition, especially in family um, yeah. and friendships and even online community, really. I totally agree. I think empathy is a huge thing in general, a huge thing that we need and a huge thing that lacks. And it's just, it's really... It's really un- unfortunate because I do feel like I'm all about having conversation about it. And I do feel like at the end of the day, if somebody can just listen to what your experience is without automatically thinking how this might be offensive to their them or their story, um, and they just hear it for what it is and receive that, I think we could we could come together as just a society in general a lot more than we have been able to. But the empathy thing... It's very interesting to me because, yeah, when you're, I mean, when you're taught not to, and I mean this in the most respectful way, but when you are taught not to think for yourself or question things or doubt things, things like empathy and emotion become way hard and then acts of service become easy because you're just kind of like, do, do, do. And that's where we gain the great community that shows up with 30 people every time you have to move. And there are awesome good things that come with that and good perks that come with um, people just kind of going straight for, to service because they have the energy to do that because they're not sitting in all these conversations trying to actually feel and hear people's pain to make greater change. They're just like, okay, how can I help in this moment? And is that service bad? Absolutely not. We need that. We need that so badly. That's that's the perk of community. But, but I wish we saw a lot more of both, of being able to sit in both spaces. Mm-hmm. The other thing I'm frustrated with when I think about you um, reaching the point of wanting to take your life is that um, if you're raised Jewish or Catholic or Mormon or whatever, evangelical Christian, 
you've got your identity, you've got your community, you've got your spirituality, you've got your life path, you, you know what your purpose is. And you just, if you, you know, if it's going right, you just do it. There's no equivalent for a secular person, really. Like, oh, you're not going to be any of these religions. You're a teen or a young adult that's secular. Oh, well, here's your morals. Here's your values. Here's your spirituality. And you already said it. It's so much work to have to figure all that out on your own. Yeah. But like, I guess your brain isn't even fully formed to your 26. Mm -hmm. So like, like I'm grateful I didn't drink or do drugs in high school or college. Cause I, I just glad I didn't have to deal with that complexity because that's a really useful time to be able to like prepare for what life's oh, yeah. going to hand to you. But like secular kids don't have that package that they can just go, Oh, well, this is me. And I still have standards and I still have an identity and I still have spirituality and I still have a community to your point. And they'll, you know, that village will help me come to age 26 with a fully formed brain without having reached the point where I wanted to die by suicide. Right. Cause that community and that structure is there for me. My kids didn't have that. They don't have that. You didn't have that. And it's yeah. just, it's something that, yet yeah, why do you have to have a religion based on myth to get a solid structure of a life path to help you get to a fully formed brain at age 26 without falling in a thousand potholes? That, you, yes, that's a, the brain <laughs> development thing is something that my siblings now almost joke about with me because I bring it up so much because I think it's so important that we actually talk about that because I'm looking at my cousins who are not Mormon, and I'm like, oh, they did not decide to drink on their own till they were in their 20s because they just saw the the real repercussions for what that would do, not just with your brain development, but the actions that that you take um, in life like they were just taught, you know, don't drink until this certain period of time, because here's how it'll affect your brain. And here are the bad consequences that could happen should A, B, or C happen. And none of it was around a myth. None of it was around religion. They were just given real practical reasons as to why you shouldn't do this. And then given the choice. And then it's like, okay, now you know all the repercussions. Like, I don't know if I would have drank or had you know, premarital sex, had I been given the real raw reality of what those consequences could be? Um, because once I started questioning faith, the faith in it then very quickly became not a good enough reason for me to not do these things. I needed real, practical, tangible reasons as to why premarital sex could end in a bad situation or um, why not understanding sexual assault could lead to more sexual assault, not just, oh, dress modestly so that guys don't touch you. I needed a way more than that for guidance in regards to how to not be sexually assaulted. And your parents aren't like, oh, Rachel's not totally choosing the Mormon way, so let's provide her with a really sound, holistic, secular you know, structure. Right. They're just like, why isn't Rachel obeying the gospel? And right. now let's kick her out. And I'm not, th I'm not throwing shade on your parents because I'm sure you were hard, just like a lot of teens are hard. Yep. And I'm sure they were just doing the best they could. But they, they're all, all they were processing is she isn't doing what she should be doing, not let's provide her with a, with another path that's holistic, right? you know, and a system that integrates well, you're just left to the, to the wolves, so to speak. Yeah. Yeah. And honestly, even with their moderate upbringing of it all, I'm sure growing up around the people we grew up around that they did bring both into play of here's why you don't do it because of the church and here's why you don't do it practically. But because all I was surrounded by yeah. was the, the church Mormon, yeah. indoctrination yeah. that it's like that trumped everything. So I do not remember a single moment where it was where I was given practical advice about this stuff. And that's not because I don't believe that it didn't happen. I'm sure I was in conversations with my dad being the logical lawyer that he is. I'm sure he gave me certain things that I wish I would have remembered. But at the time, the faith at large trumped that. It did not yeah. matter. And so it's this type of vacuum that leads people who are raised secular or people who fall away from their religious system 
to fall prey to either getting back into the religious system or to join some other cult or religious system. It's this exact vacuum. So take us now back to the story of you in the alleyway and praying because what, where this all leads you is to recommit right to back. Mormonism, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So take us back to that dark moment and then. Yeah, that was a, that was my, my first, I've had, I'll say three rock bottoms in my lifetime at this point. That was the first one. How, I, around what age? 19, I was 20? 21. Okay. I was around 21 when this happened. And, um, you're in an alleyway. In an alleyway, literally middle of the night, praying to the stars. And I was like, Heavenly Father, I need I need you to show up in, in, in a big way because I'm not going to get myself out of this. I'm not able to get myself out of this. And I don't know where I land spiritually right now. So I'll just say I am I am in a place where I believe and we can I get, think let's something's see. there. But yeah. like, you know, I don't I wouldn't say it's it's a certain religion's God. But at this time I'm praying to heavenly father and I'm just like, I need, I need something to, to happen. And within that same week or two, uh, my this dad, is after the suicide attempt, this was, so the suicide attempt was a slow roller so that, I mean, I don't know how, how graphic can we get on this? Whatever you feel comfortable. Sharing. Okay, cool. Um, I remember sitting in a conversation with my dad one, at one point who he's tried really hard to understand mental health stuff and he's gotten a lot better. But at this point, he kind of flippantly said a statement of, if any of my kids ever committed suicide, I would be so mad I wouldn't even throw them a funeral. And he, I don't remember what we were talking about, but that, that sentence stayed in my mind. So for me, it, with the suicide attempt, I basically thought to myself, I have to make it look like an accident. Maybe so, we should do a trigger warning for those who yeah. would, might be sensitive to talks about suicidal ideation or completion. Practice self-care. Yes. Yeah, okay. Yes. Perfect. So um, I needed to make it look like an accident. So what I decided to do was I only had access to, because I was living in the alleyway at this point. So I only had access to alcohol for free. Um, everything else I would have to buy. So I spent six weeks drinking myself to death and not eating food, not drinking water, not drinking anything that would provide, um, I don't know, physical healing on the backside of the amount of alcohol I would drink. I only had access to alcohol, so I only drank alcohol. And according to the internet at the time, um, without food and water, you got like a couple few days and I was thinking I'm going to be gone after about five days a week at most. And it ended up being like a brutal six week endeavor of a bender of me just like blacking out and every single time hoping that I wasn't going to wake up that time. I was like, okay, this time it's got to be it. I mean, my body shut down. I do not know how my body ever actually recovered from that. I went to the doctor after that and they don't know how my body recovered after that, but it was very, I was just doing a number on my body in hopes that I would not wake up thinking it'd be a couple of days, ended up being a few weeks and it was just brutal. And, and the thinking was that your dad wouldn't think of it as a death by suicide because it would have just been you drank. Yep. He would just think, oh, she kind of pushed her limits and drank yeah. too much. Yep. Drank too much and mm. wouldn't know that it was on purpose. So okay. that was my mentality behind okay. that. Uh, so, yeah. So then he picked me up from the, from the frat house at some point in this time. And honestly, this time is so blurry to me because I was just so, my brain could not function normally. Um, I was just dehydrated to the deep, to the highest degree. I don't remember a lot of that other than I ended up back at my house. Um, I remember when he picked me up and I remember being back at my house and I remember detoxing for months after that on my own. Cause I was still, I was, I'd never told my parents at that point how bad it was. They just knew that I was like incapable of, I don't know, thinking for myself, the conversations were hard. I just kind of hibernated and, and detoxed on my own for about six months after that. And then what, what, what brought you back to church? And then I, the relationship that I had been in my senior year of high school through all the frat lives, so we were together for like four years, ended. Oh. And um, that was pr that was pretty brutal. And it was right around the time that I thought I was, ge I was getting better. So it was... It was a surprise, um, but we we ended, and I <laughs> said to myself, "Okay, well, I've I've given the you 
everything that I have and I've experienced that to the fullest. So, and I want to kind of get back into the church and like, and like live a better life and, and not party as much. So where do I go? BYU. I drove down to BYU to hang out with my one friend that I had down there and met my future husband within that same weekend of hanging out with this group of all return missionaries, all BYU um, students, and just got roped into it, the polar opposite crowd of the crowd that I had been running with for the last few years. I mean, it must have looked really appealing, right? Clean, squeaky white, happy, yeah, chaste, more quote moral chaste. Oh yeah, youth. this was yeah. everything. I mean, my my that group and and my future husband, like he was everything that I was taught as a young women's attendee to find at, in my life. This priesthood holding return missionary, and all of his friends were like that. And um, I remember feeling like the oddball f for sure for pretty much that entire time. Um, but it was still safe. Like it felt so safe and I felt very protected and I felt like this is going to save me. <laughs> this is going to totally save me. And he was also attracted to the rebel cause he liked being the savior. So we were the, this perfectly mm, codependent, codependent match of he's going to save me. And I wanted that. And He's going to save me. And he wanted that. And it was just like, he was like reconverting me and rebringing me back into the fold. And I ate up every second of it for a period of time. Mm. I was just like, yeah, I was just like, this is going to be, this is going to be good. This is going to be great. We're going to raise our kids Mormon. And at the time it was just like, we're raising our kids Mormon, but I don't really want to get married in the temple. I was kind of like on the line there. I was like, I'm not really temple ready, but I'm ready to go back to church and to raise our kids th in the way that we were raised. So how, like, what was the amount of time between meeting him, getting engaged, getting married? And how did that all go? We met, we got engaged like eight months later. We got married a we got married within about a year of dating. So of Matt, met? Matt got married a year later. Yeah. And in that time period that we were dating, he basically was trying to, you know, get me to get back into the super active realm. We would read scriptures together occasionally and, uh, go to church together every Sunday and stuff. Um, and then we broke up for a period of time just for like a month. And in that period of time, I was like so desperate to be back with him that I was like, I'm going to read the Book of Mormon cover to cover again and like read it three times or something and got my patriarchal blessing in this period of time. And he was all really supportive of this. And I was just like, honestly, I don't even know what I was looking for, but I was so desperate for a level of safety that I hadn't had for so long that, um, that I I was just willing to kind of do whatever he wanted. So he, it was important to him that I got my patriarchal blessing. So I did. It was important to him that I read the book of Mormon cover to cover again as an adult. So I did. And, um, we ended up getting engaged like a few months after this breakup and <laughs> cause that's so healthy. And, um, at that point it was a decision of, are we going to get married in the temple? or Are we not? And I begged him for so long to not get married in the temple. I just said, I'm not ready for that level yet. I'm not ready to go to um, family events with their their expectation now being that I'm wearing my garments. And so I'm not ready to like have to cater what uh, my outward appearance to the church right now. Like I'm not, I'm just trying to figure out kind of what I believe when it comes to theology and doctrine. Like I don't want any added social pressures and the temple I feel like is going to put my family and your family in this position of thinking that I am at a certain level of Mormonism that I'm not at yet. And so the warnings came left and right. And I was <laughs> warning him. my family members were even warning him. Like, I don't know if she's going to change after you guys get married. Like, are you okay with this level of Mormon that she is, which was a goer who still occasionally drank but I still went and I wanted to raise my kids in it. So did you drink in front of him? Um, I think when we were dating, maybe one time. Um, and it was, he didn't really say anything about it. It wasn't like a big deal. I had told him, I said, if we get married in the temple, 
It finally came down to this. I said, if we get married in the temple, then that's fine. But don't expect me to stop stop drinking right away and don't expect me to wear my garments right away. And don't, and I basically gave him this list of like, here's what I'm not ready for. But if you, if you care so much, cause your parents are going to judge the situation. If you don't get married in the temple, cause there was high pressure from his family who was staunch, staunch, like way more strict Mormon than I grew up with. Um, like then I will get married in the temple, but all of these things aren't things that I'm ready for. And he completely agreed, like totally was like, that's, fine. I respect that completely. We'll take things at your own pace is the verbiage he used all the time. We'll take things at your own pace. Once you get married, once we go through the temple, we'll take things at your own pace. So we get, I, I have two questions. Yeah. Um, number one, uh, why weren't you all in? Why weren't you, because you had hit rock bottom? Like, oh yeah, I'll wear my garments. I'll, I'll stop drinking forever. I mean, because yeah. because some of the most orthodox Mormons I've ever met had those moments of dark, crashing rock bottom, and their response to that was ultra orthodoxy. And I'm just wondering why you didn't follow that pattern. And then I have a second question. I think I was <clears throat> my my depression had not fully subsided. So in regards to self medicating and things like that, I wasn't ready to fully commit to like a lifetime of sobriety. So with word of wisdom stuff, it had to do with that, and I had social anxiety around the idea of giving that up because it was a lot. Most of my friends were not active Mormon or Mormon at all. Um, and then when it came to things like garments and that type of stuff, I was just like. It was all the the social expectation. I just felt like for so long I was expected to be this certain type of person, and I was just done living like that. And I did not want the added judgment from my family who knew, knew that I was inactive. Like my aunts and uncles, they had gotten to a point where they all knew that I was inactive and it was kind of accepted, and I didn't want to put myself back in this position where they're like, oh, well— you got married in the temple, so now we we expect you to be this full fledged mo, and I'm just not mentally there yet. So I was just very, oh, and I wasn't. I mean, I wasn't mentally there yet, just because I think just time. I did. I was just didn't have enough time. I was in rock bottom one second, and the next second I was like saved by this priesthood holder. So I just didn't have enough time to really process where I was going to land in regards to Mormonism in general. At this point, I still hadn't even looked into like anything that had to do with our history or anything like that. Okay. I was just kind of like very surface level belief. Uh, next question. Uh, you talked about how some of those Mormon boys in high school would judge you for word of wisdom stuff, but they weren't super strict with themselves with law of chastity stuff mm -hmm. how, well, during courtship. And, you know, was he flexible in those ways or was he staunch in those ways? Did he fit the pattern of those high school Mormon boys? Oh, he fit the pattern. He fit the pattern okay. for sure. Yeah, he we did not. Um, I had already lost my virginity before, like before him, he had not. So he did want to save his virginity for marriage, which we did, but everything else was kind of like, it was kind of like he'd give way to certain things in that realm. And then when it came to drinking or coffee, even, I remember his mom finding an iced tea bottle in his car and, and there was a scene that was created around this iced tea bottle that was mine because like, who is drinking iced tea in our household? But those things would be like highlighted as bad. And then, you know, what we were doing in our private time was definitely not along the lines of the Mormon church in the staunch ways that he, that he gave off that he was following. I mean, that's, that's that kind of that pattern of BYU of like doing everything, but, and all the creative ways to, to be sexual without tradition, just explicit intercourse, I guess. Right? Yeah. 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 So they that, really got away with a lot of things that, <laughs> that they didn't deem as like breaking a rule, but he honestly felt, did feel really guilty like every, every time, but you know, he'd give away to temptation. It was just kind of weird that he just never, he the word of wisdom was judged so much harder than the law of chastity. And that's so weird because number one, the word of wisdom when it was written was optional. Yeah. It was a recommendation. And then secondly, we're taught that premarital sex is next to murder. Right. So like word of wisdom stuff, the hammer's being thrown down on you. He's all like above you and his family's all above you. 
And yet he's as engaged in the sin next to murder as much or more than you. And yep. like free pass, like no big deal. That's a weird hypocrisy. It is weird. And I would say those exact same things to him. Like even in Bishop interviews and stuff, I remember thinking that answering questions about the law of chastity was way worse. Like I was way more nervous around those topics. And those topics got more punishment in mm. regards to like how long you had to go without taking the sacrament. I remember if I could confessed to a sexual sin, I couldn't take the sacrament for close to six months to a year. And if I admitted to drinking, my bishop was like, all right, three weeks or something like that. So I remember using these things to argue with my husband about like, why am I not being punished for these things as much? And you're saying that these things are like, okay, like we'll let that fly. It just made no sense. It made no sense. So you ultimately agreed to get married in the temple? Yes. And were you guys worthy, uh, you know, to get married in the temple? <laughs> I wouldn't say so. I, I wouldn't say, I'd say we were trying real hard. Um, for me, I'd be like, we were really good uh, by the time we got married in the temple. But from his sta for his standards, he probably felt a little guilt going in. Um, but I remember like... I took my endowments out three days before we went through to get married. So we did the whole, my first time going through was three days before. And I remember he was just so excited. Nothing that we had done leading up to that moment mattered at this point. Like at this point, anything, any little sin that we had committed together, he's like, it did not matter. He was just stoked that I was about to go through the temple for the first time. And so I'm reading his like his anticipation for this moment. And we're driving to the temple. And I remember going with my mom, who was like moderately active at this point, my aunt's mom, who is the mother Teresa of Mormonism, still is to this day, um, very active, very loving, and then him. And I was expecting this great experience because that's what he was amping me up for. And when I went through for the first time, I remember being in like being coming out of it like four or five hours later, just ghost white and just felt like I was going to throw up and I couldn't talk to him for the majority of the rest of that night. I was kind of just really surprised. What was wrong with the temple? I was so shocked at, um, <sighs> all right. I'm trying to phrase this in the most respectful way possible. Shoot. Okay. I, real. <laughs> was really shocked at how culty it was. Um, I was shocked at, like I picked up on things like when we were watching the video of Adam and Eve, how Satan would tell the church to do something or Satan would make a request and then we would pause the video and do the request that Satan had requested. And I was like, that is weird. Okay, that's interesting. And um, I remember like getting like the temple name and all of that stuff and just going, why does any of this matter? Like, why does, because my relationship with the heavenly father that I knew, who I was always so close to in prayer. I'm like, why does any of this matter? And why'd I you just, need a, why'd you need a new name? Why do I need a new name? Why yeah. do I need to be covered? Why is a veil covering my face right now so that the men can go do A, B, and C? And I'm just kind of sitting here. I felt like, like it, I was living the documentaries of cults that I had watched prior to that. Um, especially when it came to like even fundamentalist Mormons, like I, for my whole life had defended the Mormon church against FLDS because I was like, no, we are not even close to that. We don't do like weird traditions or things like that. And then I'm going through the temple and I'm like, we do a bunch of weird stuff. It's just we don't talk about it or, or show it on TV or anything like that. So I just felt almost betrayed by my own traditions. I was just like, this is really, really bizarre. And I just, the, the day that I found out, and I'm pretty sure it was all on the same day, the day that I realized that my ex was going to have to be the one to call me through the gates of heaven. And like, in order for me to reside with my God for eternity, that or for me to gain eternal life or start an eternal planet that I would have to wait for my husband to call me through. That to me was so jarring 
in that moment, I didn't even really have like words for it. And I knew that if I were to express that to him, I wasn't sure if we'd go through with the wedding that was in three days. So I had so much that I was thinking about because I wanted time to process what I was struggling with from that experience. But I only had three days. And so I kind of just buried it. And it was very obvious how I felt about it. I couldn't hide my face. But um, the next day, I kind of was just like, okay, that happened, and we're going to continue with the wedding. But it was really jarring to go through. For those who don't know, in the Mormon temple, men and women receive new names. But the husband is allowed to know the wife's new name um, because there's a moment in the temple ceremony where the husband brings the wife through the veil, and he needs to call her name. And that's how it's going to be in heaven. Mm -hmm. And so that's also why the husband needs to know the wife's name, because in heaven, when they get exalted, it's the husband that's going to bring the wife through the veil, but the wife can't know the husband's name. Yeah. And so there's this weird patriarchal thing going on, right? Yep. It's, it's, it's very weird. It's very, it was very weird. And I just, I remember being in the last room of the ceremony and I finally see him there in the room and he's just kind of giving me this look like wasn't that the most amazing thing <laughs> you've ever experienced and i'm sitting there going like where's the nearest trash can because i actually want to puke like i did not feel good i just i just really i felt physically ill and i and he saw my face and was just like oh, it didn't like that moment didn't save her. Okay, I don't know what what we're gonna do, and it was just kind of weird. It was. But by weird. then, it's like three days to the yeah, to three the wedding. days till the wedding. Yeah, we really didn't have a choice at that point, mm, so we thought because to call it all off is a big deal. Yeah, mm. you would have gone through probably when the woman hearkened to the husband. So the husband um, committed to God to obey God, but the woman would commit to the husband to kind of hearken to the husband's counsel. So yep. the woman's covenant wasn't with God, it was the husband. And then the husband's covenant was with God. That yep. that would have been how it was. They've changed that since you went through. Oh, because great. Feminists, <laughs> cause feminists complained enough. Yeah. But for a hundred and whatever, 80 years. Yeah, it was like it was like it was. Yeah, I must've been right on the, the yeah. cusp there. Also, they, they, women don't have to veil their faces anymore. Wow. Which is brand, pretty, pretty much brand new. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, feminists. You know, thank you, internet. Well, I, I mean, yeah, even with like garments, I think I was still in the era where you, you had to wear your bra over your garments mm -hmm. and things like that. And it was just like, how awesome was that? <laughs> it was so awesome. <laughs> it was my favorite thing. It was just, honestly, I'm pretty, I'm, imagine wearing a t shirt thing. under your bra, basically. Yeah. 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 <laughs> like a silk Spanx, but your bra's <laughs> over it. And so it's very slippery and it's not ideal. It was weird. So you, uh, but you did it. You got married. Got married. I got married and I remember telling Trevor that week, I shouldn't have used his name, but that's okay. I've already used it on social media. Um, I remember telling him, you know, I just really don't want to do this because I think the reaction from my family is going to be pretty obvious and I don't want, I don't want to be judged for a day that I don't wear garments. Well, me being, you know, the rebel that I am, the day after we get married, it's August, it's really hot, I'm in short shorts and a t-shirt and we're moving my stuff from my, wherever I was living to our new apartment. And I remember I had a family member come over and my ex is right next to me and she just looks at my thigh and puts her finger on my thigh and just goes, wow, already? And totally makes like this mm. moment out of me not wearing my garments. She within garment 24, shamed She garment shamed me within 24 hours of my wedding. And I just remember looking at, looking at him just going like, basically with this look of like, see, exactly what I was afraid of happening happened less than 24 hours after we got married. And he was like, I think pretty worried at that point because he knew I was right and I don't think he knew how to deal with it. So, so mm. yeah, that happened. And we, uh, we went on our honeymoon and I got wasted on our honeymoon. Cause at that moment I'm kind of thinking, I think we were both thinking, what did we just do? And I operated in self-medicating mode. And, um, at large, it was like uh, f the trip was fine. It wasn't like taint totally tainted by that. But I think he was mad I at you for drinking on your. Oh, no, he was. Your... He was. I think at that point, looking back, he emotionally detached in that moment. 
he started emotionally detaching after we went through the temple when he realized it was not going to be a coming to Jesus moment for me, that that ceremony was not going to save me, that it was going to take a lot more than that <laughs> for me to be in it. And he really could not deal with that very well. And so we almost both, no one I've entered, you know, we're 1600 episodes into Mormon stories. Almost no one had a good temple experience that I've ever interviewed. <laughs> Like literally almost no one. Not even the people who were like super active too. Not even them. Like I mean, occasionally it happens, but No, I think they're so shocked. They're right, so Jen? shocked. Right, Jen? Yeah, not for me. It was, <laughs> it was not good for me either. So. Yeah. And you were I, super active at you. the time that you like yeah, super I was believing. super, <clears throat> I was, I was super active and uh, all the things that you listed, like I wrote them down as you were saying them and I'm like, yep. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's it's like the same list in my mind of everything. If you weren't a blackout party frat sorority girl. You were a no faithful, devout yeah Molly Mormon. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yep. The time. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yep. That's my sibling stories too. The the devout one still went through. Like what? <laughs> <laughs> like what was that? That <laughs> that's a part of our church? No. Yeah. And now Russell and Nelson's built a hundred. Announced a hundred temples in like four years. Like they're they're tripling oh down. Oh my gosh. They're tripling down on temples. <laughs> oh my gosh. Anyway. We're saturated. We're off, we're off track. Okay. <laughs> so you get married, you have your honeymoon, and your husband's like, What did I do? She's not But He's you're totally, on the other yeah, hand regretting it. <laughs> but on the other hand, you're like not you sleeping in the alley. Right. You're not getting you're not wanting to die, not black blackout drunk all the time. So for you, you've upgraded your life. Yeah. Right? Yeah, I've totally upgraded. I've, I've upgraded and we're like still like, you know, going to church and I kind of feel like, okay, I've landed in at least what I was always brought up to believe I should have as a woman. I've, I've got it. I've got this priesthood holding husband who's going to raise our kids Mormon and he's going to, you know, go to school and it's all going to be about his career and he's going to be in oral surgery. So he's going to be super successful. And it's like all about that. And, um, I really thought that I had made it. I just thought, you know, in comparison to where I was two years prior to our wedding, like I'm in a good spot. So even if I'm drinking occasionally, that's still miles better than where I was before. So I'm thinking that he's going to kind of give me this pat on the back. And instead it was like, you are not even close to where I need you to be at this point. And he didn't really bring a lot of that up throughout. We were married for a year total. And he mm. didn't really bring that up through the remainder of that year. He would get very upset when I would drink. And rightfully so. Because at that point, I was really trying not to. And the only time that I would is when I was like really self-medicating with it. And I would become suicidal in those moments because I just felt trapped in the marriage. And I didn't really know how to say that. Um, and so we both felt trapped in different ways and just never communicated that to each other. So we never uttered the word divorce that was not mentioned. So when he filed out of the blue, it was like, I was completely shocked. Was that a bad first year overall, just in terms of how you got along? It didn't seem like a bad first year. It seemed like we were, we, we got along, we were great friends it was all to do with church stuff. Every single fight we would get in, every argument, it all was centered on, this is what Heavenly Father wants us to do, and this is what you are doing, and they're not adding up. And that is what he would say, and he would speak in, in those ways as well. Like I joke now when I watch Under the Banner of Heaven, I'm sure a lot of people have seen that by now, I've heard from a lot of active Mormons like, oh, it's, people don't really talk like that, like how they say Heavenly Father, all the this and that all the time. Sure, to a certain degree, they had to get the script across, so they had to exaggerate in the way that they were speaking. But I have proof of my ex speaking the exact same ways that Andrew Garfield speaks in the show to me while we're getting divorced, saying, you know, Heavenly Father just really wants you to... Um, 
wear your garments, but like he wants you to want to wear your garments and things like that. He was saying to me and I'm like, but I'm trying really hard to want to wear, do these things, but I can't help that I don't want to. I'll do them, but I don't want to do them. And I don't know how to change the fact that I don't want, that I don't have a desire. And for him, it was very much around like heavenly father's desires are this, that, and that. I'm like, oh, really? Because uh, that's just not adding up to like my experience, but okay. And this is probably a hard question, but like what kept you from just stopping drinking cold turkey and wearing the garments and just submitting to the church and to your husband? Because of the hypocrisy that I was seeing from the people who were claiming that this is what you should be doing. So for, for, if I can just call my ex out for a second and he knows that I'm did was in the wrong a lot too, but like he in these same moments where he was telling me to do all these things was also not the one prepping the CTR sevens lesson, which is who we taught. Like uh, we were assigned roles and I was the one creating the lessons for these kids. And I was the one paying our tithing at the time. And I was the one trying to figure out how to help the person whose spouse had just died or whatever, you know, get on the lasagna train. Like I was the one thinking about all these things in regards to actually living what I viewed to be a Christ-like life. He just cared about the checked boxes and then was spewing all of this Heavenly Father jargon to me at the same time. So I never wanted to fully buy into it because I, I, wasn't, I wasn't sold on the fact that the people who do do those things are the Christ-like ones. Like I was all about like, who are the Christ-like ones here? Who are the ones who are going to be driving to church and see the person on the side of the road who needs help and stop to help them knowing that they're going to be late for church versus the one who's going to pass the person who needs help because being on time to church is important. My ex was the most, most of the time, the one who needed to be on time to church versus, and this is not me trying to make myself sound like a saint in any way, but I would be thinking more about, okay, where are the burnt out and the beat down people that we actually need to help versus what boxes have we checked today? What, what scriptures have we read today? How many days of the week have we prayed today? I didn't give a rip about that stuff at that point, because I'm hearing it coming from somebody who didn't care about actually helping the person in need. This may sound harsh, but what about just falling in line to save your marriage or because you loved him? Um, I, well, I did. I did to like a pretty deep degree towards the end there. So like he did not give me warning signs that a divorce was going to take place in the slightest. So by the time he throws that word out, his bag is already packed and he moved to a friend's house like that same day. So I was in shock. And in this state of shock, we probably stayed in a council type uh, state of mind in our marriage for about two months. And in that two months, I was willing to do anything. Like I remember having recordings of myself saying like, I will... I, I want to want these things and I will do anything. And I was promising him at that point that I would like, fine, I'll try to wear my garments and I'll, I'll do this and I'll do that. I mean, I really like pleaded with him for a long, long time. Like when it really came down to the divorce, he went full force with it. And we, we had filed and it was done within like a few weeks. It was very, very quick. And for me, I would have, I would have like done everything anything to make it work, including all those things that I didn't believe were necessary. You feel like you loved him? Yes. I feel like I did love him f at the time. Now having experienced real deep love, I don't think that that's, that was love. I think that we were more buddies though. Like we did have a good friendship and I care about him still and I want the best for him, but, um, it wasn't, unconditional love. It wasn't, it wasn't unconditional. That's, that's what it was. I, we had very, we had love. It was very conditional. Yeah. And, and like you said, with your own family, Mormons often aren't raised to talk about the hard stuff. Yeah. So I can, I can imagine you just being caught totally off guard because he wasn't communicating as explicitly with you as maybe he could have. He's yeah. probably afraid to. I'm also guessing that maybe he was keeping his parents informed about your lack of obedience mm -hmm. and maybe his parents were like fishing, you know, cut bait before you guys have kids and you can find the right girl. 
You know yeah, I mean? yeah. He actually, I remember him calling his stake president from his home ward in Florida, basically saying, this is what's going on and should I leave her? And the stake president told him to leave me. And that was the thing that I was really wrestling with because I'm like, but the church that I grew up in my whole life is anti-divorce. Even if somebody's being abused, like they'll like kind of advise you to stay in it. So I'm like, this is not surely what I'm doing is not the worst thing in the world is what I was thinking. And yeah, he definitely had support on the backside of the divorce. Basically like, yeah, sure. This is, you should totally do that. If she's not a faithful member, then you should leave. Hmm. So what was that like to have your Hollywood marriage, not your Hollywood, like your fairy tale Mormon marriage end in a year? I was devastated. I mean, I was, I was so, my life, my life vision for the upcoming 10 years was so catered towards what he wanted to do and where we were going to move for him and also, I had been just trying so hard to get back into like the active fold that I just felt like I just kind of felt like I lost everything. I was losing my my faith, my sense of reality and my husband all at the same time. Plus, it's so embarrassing familially and socially because a, a temple marriage within Mormonism is such a celebration. You invite everyone, your parents, your grandparents, your aunts, uncles, siblings, yeah. all the ward members, they all come and it's like, it's like, Oh, she did it. She's back on track. So like to disappoint everyone in your familial and social structure after only a year, I can't imagine what a burden that must've been psychologically to you. Yeah, I mean, luckily, my side of the family, other than a handful of people who took his side, my side of the family was not surprised because I had been the rebel my whole life. So they were kind of going, all right, mm. we didn't see you staying in the church forever. And they didn't tell me this till after we were divorced. But um, but I was just very, I, was, I felt very betrayed by the community at large that he was getting support to divorce me when that's the last thing that I thought the church would support. Mm. And so when the church at large and leaders within the church supported his divorce, when I'm sitting here trying and working my butt off to try to like be the active goer, it was just, it was super jarring, super devastating. Yeah. But Yeah. Okay. So where to go from there? Christianity. <laughs> so you had to, you would have had to fully deconstruct Mormonism to move to Christianity, right? Kind of, you would think, except that I jumped into Christianity so fast um, after that, that my deconstruction of Mormonism happened simultaneously that my reconstruction of like biblical beliefs in Christianity happened. So it was really confusing. I didn't really have a moment where I deconstructed all of the Mormon church and then was kind of agnostic or atheist and was just like, oh, yep, this is what I've come to terms with. It was very much a, okay, I'm going to jump into this belief and learn this belief and at the same time ask questions to my core group at the Christian church. Like, is this a Mormon thought or a Christian Okay, wait, back, let's back up. So how do you go, you get your temple divorce, your ceiling is whatever, how do you convert to Christianity as a Mormon, even as a liberal Mormon or a lax Mormon or as a semi-jack Mormon? Yeah. That doesn't just happen. How did, how did it happen? It happened, um, well, it was about six months after our divorce. I just, it, okay, no, I'll back up. The month that we were getting divorced, I had one coworker out of a bunch of Mormon coworkers. I had one Christian coworker. And I remember telling her, like, I have always had a relationship with God, so I thought, and I don't know how to lose that on top of my religion, but uh, but this religion's the only true religion. And I was kind of like fighting for the religion to her, and to which she just basically said, you know what, I'm going to send you some stuff. I just want you to listen to it. No pressure whatsoever, but I think it'll bring you some comfort. And I was willing to try anything at this point. So 
I, uh, she started sending me sermons and worship music and I had never in my life heard a sermon before I had been to Jewish ceremonies and I had been to Catholic mass before, but I had never really listened to like a non-denominational charismatic pastor, um, speak on the, the Bible. So I started listening in my cubicle nine to five job, eight hours a day of, sermons. And in between each sermon, I'd listen to worship music, which for me as a musician, going from hymns that I thought were just sinfully boring to worship music was like my world exploded in the best way. I was like, whoa, this is truth. And my I kind of ignorantly thought that I was in this moment stepping into oh, this is the ultimate truth. Like I've been being told my whole life that I've landed on the ultimate truth when really the Bible and the things that I've had right in front of me my whole life that the Mormon church kind of claims to follow, depending on the translation, uh, is in fact, like there's so much more to, to figure out here when it comes to the Bible. And like, I didn't feel like I was losing all of Mormonism because I was like diving into the Bible. So I was just like, okay, I can receive this. And the sermons were very easy to swallow. And they're very much about just being a good person with a couple scriptures thrown into there. And it was, it piqued my curiosity. So that's where it all started was just me for five months, I think, just listening to hours of sermons and worship music every single day at my job. Do you remember who the pastor was for the sermons you listened to? I remember it was from a church called VBF Vegas, like Bible Fellowship, Vegas Bible Fellowship. Um, I don't remember the pastor's hmm. name, but it was some, some church in Vegas. in Vegas. Okay, okay. Yeah, some big mega church. And um, it was like, it was very charismatic and the, and the music was so beautiful and, and moving and like real. Like I felt like, oh, these people are on fire for Jesus. Like the Mormon church claims to be the one true church, but the passion that I see for Jesus isn't there in comparison to what I experienced at the Christian church. I experienced just like every ounce of everyone's day and thought and musical likings, all were surrounding just Jesus. And I was like, whoa, these people actually know what they're talking about. These people actually like study the truth is what I, what I like thought in my mind at the time. So it was, um, five months of that until I finally, she invited me to a church service at some, uh, South mountain in Draper here. Um, I went there for uh, like a couple weeks in a row, just kind of as an attendee to just, it was the first time that I was experiencing everything that I had been listening to for so long in real life. So I felt like I was like seeing a celebrity for the first time live at a concert. It was just the pastor spoke very similarly to the pastors that I had been listening to on a podcast and the worship music was live and incredible and the exact same to what I'd been listening to. Was Pastor Rick at South Mountain? Yes. Okay. So we've, we interviewed Pastor Rick. Oh, really? At South Mountain on Mormon Stories. Oh, nice. So okay. I'll, yeah. We'll include that in the show notes. So, okay. So he was the pastor. He's yeah. not there anymore, but he was the pastor. Rick and Paul were yeah, the Paul, pastors. Paul was like Paul one Roby, of the founder. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think he's might be still there. Yeah, he's still from there. From what yeah. I know. Yeah. yeah um, I remember going there and I got involved in, they have a transition class that I'm sure he talked yeah. about. So I jo joined that. Russ Webster, did you meet him? I, I don't think so, okay, no. Right. But I remember going to their Mormon transition class and I was like, oh my gosh, this is so cool. This is making everything make so much sense. And I remember talking to the worship pastor at the time, Paul's son, and saying, you know, I sing and I don't know if that's to any use to you, but I'd love to join the team. And it just never really happened. I just ended up being kind of just an attendee there. Um, it wasn't until a few months after going there just as a kind of a ghost that I met somebody through a job interview who said, hey, I used to go to the, that church too, and now I'm going to this one 15 minutes away, and they're looking for worship leaders. And to me, just kind of wanting to be a part of a community again, and if it had to do with singing involved, I was all here for it. I was like, okay, well, where is this church, and can I come, can I come visit it? And that's the first day that I stepped into the church that I ended up becoming a, like a major role at. And do you, do you want to mention that name or do you not want to mention that church? I'll keep that off just okay. in case. Okay. okay. So, um, 
So you attended South Mountain just for a few months. Yeah. But then you found this new church. Yeah. And uh, and you were interested in taking, was it a leadership role? Is that fair to say? I wasn't even interested in that. I just wanted community. And even if I could sing at the same time, I was like, that's cool. And at this point, I started having a testimony, I guess, if you will, of, of Jesus Christ. And I just kind of wanted to know more about it. So I remember showing up on the first day, it was loud. It was a lot more loud and lively than South mountain, um, s- lights. And it was like a party church. And well, cause South mountain has rock bands. Yeah. So I and mean- so do we, so we had rock bands and it was, but it was like, people were jumping. So so the only difference is South mountain, they're like rocking out. Right. And they're singing. You go to the church that I went to, same thing, rocking out, but we're like jumping a little harder at the same time. So it's like just one step up. Is it Pentecostal at all? Like no. like speaking in tongues kind of thing? No, there were definitely people who went to the church who spoke in tongues, um, but it was not. My pastors were very strict on like, we do not do that from the pulpit, that because of their way of interpreting a certain part of scripture that talks about tongues. Um, we were not, let's say on the surface, something that people would find to be out abnormal or outrageous. Um, we're very much like if, if anybody watches the Hillsong documentary, that is what we were. We were very lights, camera action. Here we are. My pastor was super charismatic and big screens and live band. It was, it was just really fun. Uh, we were pretty small when I went there for the first time. So I remember it was pretty obvious that I was new cause I was being introduced to everybody my first day there. And they were, they knew that that was a new face. And I tried to leave that first day, just kind of, I was a little bit overwhelmed, just overstimulated. And I remember walking out of the church that first day and the worship pastor who was on the stage that day chased me out of the building to basically be like, I've heard about you. I know you can sing. Do you want to join the worship team? And I was like, um, yeah, like absolutely. Like I had kind of tried to get involved at South Mountain for a while and it just wasn't happening. So I was like, yes, like I would love to. And that same week I auditioned and it was like the rest was history. I was I was a weekly, not just goer, but volunteer from that point forward. And this this church isn't quite as big as South Mountain. Cause South Mountain was it felt huge to me. It's not like a fifteen thousand mega church, but it right. felt really big. This church, my th- this church is at this point, I think, surpassing it. They're oh, pretty big at this. But point. when you but when you joined, but it, when I joined, we were very small. Oh, so it's grown since it's you joined. It's grown a okay. ton. Yes, that's five yeah. years or so. Yeah, it's about five four years. So so having been raised Mormon, having your parents and siblings still be Mormon for the most part, all your friends, like, what was it like? to be really getting into an, an evangelical evangelical or a non-denominational Christian church in Utah where your whole family and friends are all still Mormon. Like what's going through your mind? Cause that's, I, I when I left Mormonism, I investigated other religions. Mm-hmm. I could never feel comfortable anywhere. I tried Episcopalian, I tried, um, you know, uh, Lutheran or, you know, Presbyterian or Methodist. I tried even, Unitarian Universalist and just nothing felt right. Yeah. So what I'm curious how you got over that because we, you kind of learn a spiritual language in whatever yeah. religion you were brought up in and that becomes familiar and that becomes your spiritual language. So it's almost like trying to learn another language, but it just for me felt weird and awkward and almost, it almost felt like I was cheating on God Yeah. To pursue another religious tradition. How did you experience that? Yeah, no, I've had many friends who will say the same thing, who have come to my church um, because I'll invite everybody. My take at this point was because we were so small and my pastors saw a potential like worship leader in me, I think, and they had the time to really cater to my needs at that point, I got all hands on deck for my transition where, um, they were just kind of make helping me make sense of the doctrine doctrinal differences that I was wrestling with. And then like 
they would validate me in these ways that I had never been, um, that I had never had before. Like the first time that I was ever able to say that I think that Mormonism, growing up Mormon was kind of like culty was because of them, because they were like, man, like that must have been so difficult to grow up in like something that is so oppressive. And, and now like we can help you find freedom in Jesus. And like, it's not about checking boxes and it's not about religion. It's about relationship. And they use that language a lot. It's not about religion. It's about relationship. And so what I felt like I was finding was not a new religion. I felt like what I was falling into was just like the, was a next level mindset of truth that I had just so happened to land on like the perfect situation. And Everything that I would talk about that had to do with like, well, I don't think I could be- I could believe in another religion again. Like, I just don't know how I could do that. They would immediately come to the backside with, oh, no, this isn't that, though. Like, this is not a religion because of this, that, and the other. This is just a relationship with Christ, and we're just trying to do our best as broken humans to uh, to follow the teachings of Jesus. It was very, like— very sugar-coated and very simple. Like they made the gospel seem simple and that language was used too. It's just like the gospel is simple. And what is it? What was it? If it's simple, what was it? It's just that Jesus died for us. So we do not have to do any works whatsoever to gain our salvation. We just have to believe in him as the son of God, period. And if you believe that Jesus is the son of God, it does not matter what you do in this life, you will have eternal life. And there's no different levels of anything like that because they're very, you know, heaven and hell. So it's just like, you just have to believe in Jesus and that's it. And we're all broken and we can stay that way and that's totally fine. And as long as you believe Jesus is the one true savior, you're good. And I was like, okay, that to me, I could get behind at the time because I was so used to Mormon mentality of the box checking off of the boxes and the doing all of the things in order to gain salvation or be be worthy of unconditional love. Mm-hmm. And here they're telling me, you don't need to do anything. You you just have to be. And that was so appealing to me that then everything else that followed was just everything made more sense as to why I would then believe that they had truth versus Mormons, um, that they had more truth. So I can see why that doctrinal simplicity that began with unconditional love and, and just immediate worthiness and that wasn't checkbox oriented, that was grace and not works. I can see why that was appealing to you. And I, I am noticing that it was a social conversion of sorts because they were love bombing you. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I mean, that pastor running out. Of, okay, I'm going to get to the pastor running out after you, but 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 it felt like, it, 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 it feels like love bombing. And I'm just, I'm noticing the fact that when you're like about to leave Mormonism, you don't have ward members that are love bombing you. Yeah. And it, like, I want to start there. Like why, what is it about Mormon culture where you weren't love bombed to keep you from leaving? Have you ever thought about that? I have a little bit and I honestly think it stems from fear. I think active members, they don't really want to know why you're leaving because if the reason is legitimate and valid, what do they do with that? Because then that's that's going against their core beliefs. So they don't want to look at it. So they'll they'll love me from a distance. My ward was never like talking crap about me behind my back after I left or anything. But it was like it was very much like we're not going to engage. Like my I had ward members who were friends with my family come to some of my non-denominational Christian events sometimes because they're just like, oh, we just want to show our support, but never would they want to actually listen to the reasons why I left because that could shake their faith a little bit. But that's kind of like a real missed opportunity. It's almost like the church saw you as, oh, we're losing her. Oh, she's going the dark side. Oh, she's got a problem with some of the check boxes. She's struggling with the commandments. Well, okay, take care. They're not, they're not, coming at you with the sense of love and community and support, which leaves you vulnerable to another community that does show that level of love 
and support and community. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I, I, think it's very easy to assume people's reasons for their actions. That's very easy because we can make it make sense with our own reality. And when you actually listen to somebody's experience and take it as truth, it most likely will jack up certain parts of your own reality. And that's uncomfortable. And we don't like to be uncomfortable. So, yeah. But the weird thing is, is Mormons love bomb you on your way in. If you're a convert, if you're an investigator to the church or if you're an eight year old kid, you're going to get love bombed the heck out of, you know, you're, they're going to love bomb you to death. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I've now learned, unfortunately, that that's not uh, unique to Mormonism, that when you leave a Christian church as well, you're very much mm, pushed out okay. so that the narrative could be yeah. controlled and So that's not like just that. a moment thing to love bomb you on the way in yeah. and kind of like ignore you on the way out or even push you on the way out. That's, that's maybe more of a human thing than a Mormon thing. Yeah. All right. So this, but this church is love bombing you in Yeah. and the doctrine felt more affirming and supportive and simple. Yeah, it appealing, felt more appealing. Right, it felt more simple. I mean, even down to things like sacrament versus we call it communion in Christian church and the fact that, you know, sacrament gets taken from you if you sin versus I go to Christian church and communion is offered to you more if you sin or it's like cuz it's solely for the oh, reason that's of that's interesting. You know, in you do you take this in remembrance of Jesus's sacrifice, why the crud would we ever not take it? As a sinner, because we you would think you would need it more. Oh, if isn't you're a that sinner. interesting, Jen? Like, yeah. like Jesus is all about helping you get clean. Why would you take the sacrament away from people when they're struggling? That's when they would need it most. Exactly. Right. Interesting. Same with temple. Like I've heard people say that it's like, mm-hmm. oh, you sinned, you can't go to the temple. It's like, wait a minute. Yeah. Wouldn't Heavenly Father want you having your most sacred, if, if the temple were only sacred, wouldn't he want you having the most sacred spiritual experiences Yeah. when you're struggling the most? Yeah. The LDS Church, I think, uses it as a shame thing Yeah. to get them to do what they want. It gets you in line. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, um, that there were things like that that unfolded before my eyes constantly, like multiple times a day for years, where it was just a continual validation that where I was at was, it, it, I thought, right and true and, you know, everything, but at least at bare minimum, better or more true than the Mormon church, because they were making sense of things for me that were biblical. And as a Mormon, I still claimed to believe in the Bible. You know, it's like depends on where you grew up, I guess, in Mormonism how much you believe in the Bible, but they were making sense of the Bible to me that was directly contradicting where I could kind of look at things they were saying and go, oh, the Mormon church is directly contradicting what Jesus himself said, according to the Bible. And that's where I was like, I'm going to save every Mormon in Utah is what I thought. (laughs) I literally got to this mindset of just my goal at that point was, okay, now that I've figured it out, I'm going to now take this and set this Jesus tone example for the entire Valley of Salt Lake City and all my Mormon friends and family that like, <laughs> I'm going to just lead by example because I now know truth from Jesus's own mouth. And I'm going to use that to save them from the Mormon church is what I thought. Yeah, what there would be became. like a little bit of that in your mind though, because you would be saving them from all the shame, all the boxes to check Ooh, off yeah. and you'd be saving right. them. You would, and you'd be offering, offering them what you learned there. That is just the grace yeah. of Christ that they need. Yes. I think so many, and this is why I had such a hard time when I started my TikTok at first, because I was like, well, evangelical Christianity saved my life from Mormonism. So I did not want to be somebody who was going to prevent a an ex-Mormon who had just left Mormonism who needs something from going to a Christian church. But now after all the things I've experienced, I like can't I can't get behind that anymore. But for we'll me it was we'll life it was life saving, <laughs> you know. So what did let's just go through some of the main tenets and how they shifted from the Mormon version to the to the um, non-denominational Christian version. So how did your view of God change? 
Um, well, the Trinity is totally different. So God, the Father, Holy Spirit, all in one in Christian church where Mormonism, you, like that you know. Change? Um, no, I, that change, honestly, I could never fully get my brain to completely get behind it because it didn't make that a lot of sense. But, um, I would just kind of pray to, I started praying to Jesus instead of like heavenly father, I would pray to Jesus specifically, um, who I then was taught, you know, was just God in the flesh. And so Jesus, God, it kind of depended on what mood I was in. If I needed an older brother figure, I'd pray to Jesus in that moment. If I needed a father figure, I'd pray to God in that moment. And then if I was going into a situation where I knew I needed the strength of the Lord, I'd operate in and through the Holy Spirit is how he, we would phrase it. So um, my belief of God, my relationship with God didn't change too much because I always had a pretty prayerful life. Um, but yeah, the Trinity was pretty weird for me to wrap my head around at first, but I, it got behind it. It wasn't like a hold up for me. I was just kind of like, well, I don't think we'll ever fully know that or be able to understand it because Christians themselves can't even fully understand the the Trinity or like explain it to its fullest. They always have somewhere where they stop. So I'm like, okay, I just was okay with not knowing fully. So God was the same. What about the role of Jesus, the atonement, that sort of thing? The atonement was everything because all of a sudden this atonement that I thought I had to work so hard for, to earn basically was now just given to me. And my appreciation and my gratitude towards Jesus Christ was like out of this world. It's all I could talk about. I honestly, it, asking any of my friends who have been around me for the last five years, I'm the Jesus freak friend because it's all I could talk about. I was just like, how can, how are we not all operating with just this abundance of gratitude at all times that he would do this for us. And like the celebration of Good Friday, not just Easter, but Good Friday and Palm Sunday and all those, all the holidays that surround Easter. I was like, why aren't Mormons who claim to have the truest truth of all truths celebrating these things? Like, why aren't we honoring the resurrection or like the, and even the gruesome sides of that? Like, why aren't we really trying to understand what Jesus went through claiming to be the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Like, why aren't we really understanding that? And so I felt like Christians really held this deep appreciation um, and gratitude for just what Jesus did, because now they can live in sin, and it's totally fine, And it, because we are free. We're free by the grace that Jesus gave us when he died. So I just felt, I, as far as Jesus is like, I do remember when I was Mormon looking forward to Easter and Christmas specifically because we talked about Jesus more than we did on other days where it was like Mormon stories specifically. Um, but at, in Christian church, I was just like, wow, every single Sunday is like Easter. Every single Sunday we're talking about Jesus. So my gratitude and appreciation for Jesus and my relationship with Jesus in my life or how often I talked about him or used him as an example was just like everywhere now. It wasn't just popping up occasionally. It was just saturated in who I was as a person. So then what about sin? Like what about drinking? What what about become drinking too much? What about sex with, you know, premarital sex? Like if you're oh, by the way, I don't know if you know this, but Bednar, one of the Mormon apostles, just last week gave a press conference that we reviewed part of it uh last week and we're gonna finish it this week with a QA. But he made the point to stress that the Mormon church believes you're not saved by works, but you're saved by grace, that we're not a works-based church. But what I'm hearing you say is that's not the Mormonism you absorbed growing up. Yeah, no, not really. I mean, I, especially when it came down to like the levels of heaven, I thought about that all the time. I'm like, well, here I am, definitely a celestial soul and all my family's going to be celestial. And that sucked for me to think about because I'm just like, I'm going to be so separated. But like yeah. in, in this version of it, it's like, well, if they just believe, then they'll be in heaven. Heaven's like one big party for, for everybody, basically. Yeah, that is interesting. I didn't really think about that. That the actual LDS heaven is con it's like, exclusive. It's, it's, <laughs> yeah, it's by works yeah, where you go. For sure. So how him saying that is totally 
Oh, it's ridiculous. Yeah. Well, just because we're all, you know, we try to talk about this where we will. Like, it's all about, did you get the Mormon baptism? Did you get the Mormon confirmation? Did you get the Mormon endowment? Did you get the Mormon temple wedding? Did you go yeah, on a mission? Did you check all the boxes? <laughs> were you worthy? And that's all it is, is conditions. That's what the mm -hmm. check boxes are. Right. They're meeting mm -hmm. the conditions. Yeah. yeah so to say actually, we're not a workspace church is kind of ridiculous. It's ridiculous. Yeah. If we mm -hmm. actually believed that we were not, that Mormonism wasn't a workspace based church, then we wouldn't have st stipulations for who can operate in certain roles or who can they attend suck, certain yeah. ceremonies. Go to the temple. Like, yeah. It's just the like. Temple, like Right. Like you can't, yeah, it's just, it's outrageous. It's <laughs> okay. So then what is sin? Like, I can't imagine it being okay to just sleep with whoever or to get, you know, blackout drunk all the time. So what was sin and why did you even, does that mean you just had no standards, no morality or did it work differently somehow? Um, sin was definitely still a topic all the time. Like they're still not for premarital sex. Um, some some people even go to a further degree that I saw most Mormons go and like not kiss till the altar because they're just like trying to be super pure. And purity culture is very heavy in this. But if still. you're saved, why does it matter? Right. How that's, pure you are. That's what I didn't realize in the first two years. Like the first two years, I was just eating up all this stuff as like even if it didn't make sense, I was just like, this is a, gr this is a beautiful thing. This feels like a good thing. I feel really good. I didn't look into how the fact that it actually didn't make sense at the end of the day. Cause yeah. All, so my pastors all drank alcohol and stuff. Drunkenness is when we would go about the sin. They'd bring up a specific scripture about fruits of the spirit. And we would talk about drunkenness being the issue, but drinking is not the issue. Um, and so they'd get away with certain things like that. Really at the end of the day, depending on what denomination of Christianity you're in, it's kind of all dependent on what Bible school that pastor went went to and how they interpret that scripture. And then they can go off of that because I have Christian friends who are women who don't wear makeup because of something that their pastor interpreted in the, in scripture. So I was very much under a very specific interpretation of the Bible. And that was very much like Hillsong mega church type, uh, uh, interpretation of it. So I was only going off of my pastor's interpretation of the Bible, which for him was drinking is okay. Being drunk is not okay. Uh, being intimate with your partners. Okay. But like, if, let's wait till marriage and sex is definitely not okay before, before marriage. So how did that change your ability to obey those rules or did it? Well, for the first two years, I was able to kind of just sit underneath leadership and I was very one foot one, one foot in, one foot out in regards to certain things. But I was open with my pastors about that. Like I'd go out to the bar Saturday night, come to church Sunday morning, 7 a.m. to lead worship. And then I would like tell them like, hey, I like totally drank last night. And then they would just the response was very grace filled and it was very like, OK, well, thanks for telling us you didn't need to. They would pull Mormon stuff and use it again against me like um I, we, you don't need to tell us like we're not your bishop there's not there's not a person a human being that is between you and god it's just between you and god so thanks for telling us but you don't need to type thing like i remember 2018 i was like rekindling a relationship with a friend and we had crossed a line physically and i immediately told my pastor about it and he was like oh, thank you again but let me remind you, you don't need to tell me any of this stuff. Like this is between you and God. And it was a two year process of that before I really like after the first two years fully committed and like did get rid of any and all like bad things in my life. Um, but it was like, I just really appreciated the grace filled walk that I received in that first two years of basically them being like, we know that you've dealt with this and we know that you're still dealing with these things. And, and still we're going to put you up on this stage and let you lead. And we're not going to take things from you because of that. And you can still take communion. And I was, it was just like, it seemed like I was only being loved in those first two years. And what kept you from falling into that kind of sorority life, blackout drunk, you know, just living a life of that, that led to what it led before? What, what, 
I mean, apparently it was working for you. What, what yeah. made it, what made it work for you? Do you think? I just felt fulfillment to the highest degree. I was, I was able to express my passion of music in a, in a public forum that was really cool. And we were and the amuse, music was so like touching. And so I had that my, my hobbies were fulfilled. My community was fulfilled again. And this time it was like deep rooted. It wasn't like Mormon, my Mormon community where I'd show up and I'd be bored the whole time. And then I would kind of just be like, like they would be our family friends. It was like, no, these people were really integrated into every aspect of my life. Like everybody knew everything. And I had like they became my family. I kind of wasn't super close with my family in the beginning of this whole process, um, mainly because they didn't understand it. But like this church and these leaders became my family. So I was fulfilled in community. I was fulfilled in family. I did not have to worry about things I was worried about, like being single forever. I didn't have to worry about that because I'm like, God will provide. I was just constantly around this God will provide mentality. And then I'm also sitting there under this leadership who's telling me that they see this like, this like abnormal existential calling on my life, like me specifically, and they were going to help me manifest that. So they were already kind of gearing me up for being a super volunteer or a super leader. Um, to where I just felt like even my career now was starting to align with my faith of wanting to be a pastor or at least wanting to be in ministry to a certain extent. So everything that I worry about as like a Western American of like what's important and what do you need to survive, I was being provided all of those things. So my suicidal ideation was out the door. And the only reason why alcohol was ever an issue, because I still drink now and it's never an issue because it's just like I never get... I don't like being drunk at all um, because I'm not self-medicating anymore. Like I'm just using it for what it's there for. And um, before I was only using it because I was depressed and I was trying to drown out and numb out my pain. Um, so I didn't need to do that anymore. And I equated all of that to this new relationship with Jesus and then equated that to this specific church that I was under the leadership in. Yeah, and you know, we talked about that big vacuum that you know uh, gets created when you leave like a high demand religion they provided you they filled the vacuum yeah they provided you with a sense of meaning a sense of purpose an identity a sense of spirituality a moral framework a community resolution in the afterlife um yep. moral support like they just it's it's you just you joined in a system that yep. is designed to kind of help people thrive honestly yeah yeah and i was so all in and so like easily susceptible to following like the leadership of somebody else. And they saw that and they really, I, I do believe that they loved me, but they definitely took advantage of, of the fact that I was willing to kind of dedicate my whole life to it. They were like, oh, we see this person who's literally not going to say no to anything that we want her to do. And so I just, it was my whole world. You know, you know, I've thought a lot about that. Like you watch these cult documentaries of these people that'll just do anything for the cult leader or for the, for the church or whatever. Like, I mean, I, I was, I was in that to some degree, I was in that in high school for sure. And on my mission, things happened on my mission that made it. So I was always kind of like a little bit skeptical and kind of took it on my own terms. But like, since getting kicked out of Mormonism, like I can't imagine giving my submitting to anything ever again like that. So it, it, so I give myself slack for having been raised in it. Where mm -hmm. I okay, I get my devotion on my mission, etc. But like imagining giving, wanting to give everything to anything, yeah, kind of blows my mind. So I'm wondering like how that was to be willing to give so much, to believe in something so much that you almost don't care what they ask you to do, you're, you're down. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I just fully believed because they had reiterated over and over and over again that they saw my pain and saw how Mormonism may have affected me negatively. And they were like speaking to that and being open about it. Um, 
I was like, wow, these people really, really just want to protect me. Why would they want to do that unless this was like, unless what we were doing was, was good or, or true. I just, I just was, I felt so safe underneath this group of people and so protected that they really, it's kind of like as a kid, I, I had no reason to not believe my dad. He was just my protector and my provider and all these things. And it jumped into that exact same thing. And I, the reason why, so I'm sitting where you're sitting in regards to Mormonism and how you'd never be able to go anywhere again. That's where I'm at now. Um, we'll get there and we'll get there. Uh, uh, yeah. That's where I'm at now. But at the, at the time it was like, I had been raised my whole life to think that the Mormon church was the only truth. So then to come out and find this new reality of people who I felt like were actually following the teachings of Jesus better than Mormons, I was yeah. like, well, if that was a lie, what else is a lie? Like, what else have I been lied to about? So at this point, as I'm trying to find what literal truth, I'm really just trying to find like a comfortable space to land. And that's what they were providing was just this comfortable space to land. And like, they were seemingly really open. They weren't giving me language that the Mormon church was giving me. Like, this is the only way that came in later. It creeped in later, but at the time that I needed their help and their support, um, for survival, they were really just giving me kind of the basics, the feel, the feel good basics that were totally contradicting with what Mormonism would teach. So then I going this Mormon church that has hurt me, they are siding with me on the fact that this is a bad thing, that the Mormon church is a bad thing. I just felt like so protected. There was nothing that there was no way I was going to leave, like leave that. Yeah. So when you study these high demand religions or systems, you know, there's always that love bombing initial experience. Mm -hmm. And there's always like somehow a difference between the theology that you're taught at the beginning. And it's usually very simple. It's this whole milk before meat kind of thing. And there's usually some difference between that and what you end up learning later yeah. once you're really in it. Yeah. And it sounds like there was some of that. Totally. Okay. The parallels were... Yeah, yeah, the same. Really quickly, I, I want to, like, I think of evangelical Christianity and non-denominational Christianity. First of all, is there a difference between those two? I don't think so. I, I Evangelical is like the belief of the, the Bible. To, and and all, every sect of Christianity believes in the Bible. Non-denominational is, is the... Seems like more of the the chiller version of evangelical. Does it just mean not Baptist and not like? Um, it's like you don't have to be baptized into a. It, it feels less religious it, um, to less be a church. part of it. It uh, less less church. Yeah, less less churchy. Like you still get church, but non denominational kind of seems like they can just ebb and flow with whatever they want. But it's all with under the evangelical umbrella. Okay. So it is still even, you, you would it's have identified as an evangelical. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And were you, were you baptized into it? Yes. Yeah. I, How uh, long did it take? Um, it took, well, just a couple months into going to that church. I kind of was like, I, I want to do this. I want to, cause they describe baptism. So this was another difference. They're telling me, oh, baptism for Mormon church. That's like your initiation into being a member of the Mormon church with, with, um, with that process. But in Christianity, baptism is just an outward expression for an inward change of heart, period. That's it. And I was like, well, I have had an inward change of heart. So why wouldn't I want to outwardly express that? So I then... Okay, really, so was that... Because what I... Growing up with Baptist friends, there was this idea of being saved, which meant at some point, I think, sitting in a evangelical church service being overcome with the Holy spirit. And I yep. think doing what's called an altar call mm -hmm. where you get up and like, what? Do yeah. Profess? So that's different. So you've got baptism is kind of like something you could just do on your own at any point. Doesn't it's just for you basically. Um, saying yes to Jesus is something that happens every single Sunday at the end of the sermon, the pastor will do the altar call prayer where he'll basically say, if you're willing to accept Jesus as your Lord and savior into your life, pray this prayer after me, you repeat this prayer. It's different wherever you go. It's different 
even to each week from week to week, depending on how he wants to phrase it. And what's the, what's the general premise? The general uh, premise is like, is like, God, I'm just giving my life to you. And no matter what happens, I'm just saying that I'm doing it your way now. And your way is the highest way. And, and from this point forward, I am saying that you are the Lord of Lords of my life. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen. And then he'll go. Anybody who has prayed that prayer for the first time, nobody's looking around. Everybody's eyes are closed. Just, just raise your hand real quick so that we can see you, so that we can pray for you, so that we can know that you're here. It's a numbers thing, but they're like, pray this prayer, raise your hand. Well, I mean, I could tell you just my family alone has given them at least 15 salvations because you hear the word, you're praying this prayer for the first time, raise your hand. People just hear, oh, first time? Yeah, okay, I'm visiting. It's my first time. They'll raise their hand. We then in the back behind the scenes count that as a salvation. So saying yes to Jesus and being saved, that happens during this altar call, call that you're given the opportunity to do every single week. And that's just a, it's not anything official. It's not anything that goes on paper. There's no initiation of sorts. It's just like, oh, I said yes to Jesus today. And everybody gives you a hug. And then you meet up with somebody in the lobby who gives you a Bible. And it's kind of just and they want to get your information to to keep tabs on you to make sure you come back and stuff but like it's not it's very different from baptism but that's is that called being saved yep mm -hmm. is that yeah. how you would if you say yes to jesus and you like raise your hand during that prayer or you have this moment where you're like yes i'm giving my life to jesus that is how christians define being saved and i never believed that part of theology to the fullest extent like i would look at people who are even mormon like my grandmother who's an amazing woman and never ever even in my depths of christianity did i believe that she was going to hell because she didn't believe in Christian Jesus. She believed in Mormon Jesus. But there are a ton of people at my church who would say that Mormons at large are going to hell. Okay. Um, so, so do you remember that moment you were, so you didn't think about yourself as having that moment of being saved? Is that what you're saying? Mine was pretty gradual. I think being saved happened over the course of like, being saved according to Christians happened over the course of two months of me just asking questions and being immersed in the worship team and, and a smaller group of women where we'd get together and talk about the sermon every week, kind of like young women's or relief society, but like midweek. And, um, I remember just getting to a point where I was just like, yeah, I, I mean, I believe all of these things. So I guess at this point I'm saved, but it wasn't like one moment that happened for my sister who followed me to this church six months later she did have a moment at a team night when it was like a very emotional worship set. And she just, that to her, she will claim is like her moment where she got saved. But, um, I didn't have that moment. It was, it was just gradual. And then I decided I wanted to get baptized and talk to my pastors about it. And I said, look, I don't even know if I believe in all of the Bible right now, but I do believe in Jesus and I want to follow Jesus's example. So I, uh, and I have had an inward change of heart. So I do want to outwardly express that. And I'm using all their language. And, and that's when my pastor goes. And I'll never forget this. I made a TikTok about it. I was like, he was like, you don't have to worry about studying the Bible like right now and knowing every single thing right now before you get baptized, because that will come. You're not going to wake up one day and find out that that's not true like you did with the Mormon church. So just... So get baptized. That's great. I think that's a great idea. And was, they were super supportive about it. And I got baptized in February of 2018. What was that like? Was it by immersion? It was by immersion in the lobby of the church in a big tub. And um, a bunch of people were around in the lobby. And you like, it's just a really quick, you know, same, pretty much the same prayer. I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Are you wearing white? Dunk. Like nope, a you could wear whatever. I was wearing a t-shirt that said, I've decided or I'm saved or something like that. It was like a very Christian t-shirt with um, like soccer shorts. And they dunk and then the whole lobby claps, like erupts and and applause. How'd it feel? I mean, it felt great. <laughs> I felt, I felt like, like 
This was just me making the first decision for myself in regards to something spiritual. I had the placebo effect to the max going on, and I just felt like this was the most incredible decision of my life, and I was just proud of myself in that moment. Like, a lot of my family members weren't there, and I was kind of like, okay, I'm still, I'm just doing this. Like, I'm doing this, and eventually they'll come around, and... um and it wasn't because they hated the idea. They just were kind of like, eh, they weren't going to make it a priority. But um, yeah, I just felt, I felt so loved and supported by my team of leaders there. And um, it was a really great day. I remember it being a really great day. Did you think of yourself as n no longer being Mormon or were you yes. evangelical Christian and Mormon? No, I had in preparation for being baptized at the Christian church, removed my records from the Mormon church, be just out of to be symbolic. Like I was like, all right, that's done. I'm done with that. I do not believe in Mormonism anymore. At this point, I had debunked enough theology to be like, okay, yeah, I'm, I do not believe that that church at large is true. I'm going to step into this. And I, it was like a full restart. Okay. And, um, so, oh uh, shoot. Um, I was going to ask a question. Oh, did, what did, was your family alarmed? Were they concerned? Did you, did they, you know? Um, they'll like tell me things now that they would have never admitted back then. But back then I just remember my mom was kind of like upset at the fact that I was being so vocal about it. Cause I think it was her <laughs> ward was asking questions. Just, just hush up, yeah. You know. The ward was starting to ask <laughs> some questions. They would see me post about, you know, singing about Jesus and all my captions on Instagram for years was about Jesus. And, and I think she was just really confused and kind of felt like I was like, this was me being rebellious again. Cause I had been rebellious my whole life. So I think a lot of my family almost viewed my baptism as a rebellion of like, me saying, screw you for raising me Mormon. I'm going to become a totally different religion that, and now they, they don't think that at all. But at the time, I just remember like being supported to a certain degree. My dad loved going to the church. He loved watching me and my sister sing. And that's, that's where it was at for him. Like he loved the fact that there was coffee in the lobby and he was just like, all right, yeah, this is fun church. This is rock and roll church is what he called it. And he just liked seeing his daughters up there performing. It wasn't a spiritual thing for him. I was praying every Sunday that he would like have it be a spiritual encounter of some sorts. But, um, but for him, he was just supportive of the, the hobby that we were living out. And my mom was kind of like distant and didn't really want to talk about it. And then the rest of my extended family was like, was like supportive when it was brought up, but it wasn't like, let's go out of our way to be supportive, but it wasn't, let's go out of our way to be against it either. You must have felt really amazing having kind of hit rock bottom in college and then, you know, got divorced in a Mormon. Like those are a couple really low points. Yeah. And now all of a sudden you you found something that you chose that feels right to you. You've got this, you're enveloped in this community and you're thriving. That must have felt amazing. Yeah, it felt so good. I mean, really every single box of my life that I wanted to check off that I cared about was being fulfilled in that moment. And I do remember still struggling with depression, spurts spurts of suicidal ideation throughout the first two years that I was at that church. And it just wasn't the same. It was, it was cared for differently. It was cared for in a very like proactive way. Um, so I thought where like I'd express a concern that I had with my own like depression and it would be like <laughs> immediately I'd get 30 people calling me. Can I pray for you? Can I pray over you? Like, like, can I, can I bring you something? Can I do this? Can I whatever? And I was just like, man, okay. I can in the future, if I hit rock bottom again, I'll be cared for and protected in that versus the last two moments of rock bottom that I've hit college and the divorce. I didn't feel like I got a rally of support around that. I felt like I healed from those things on my own. And now I'm looking at this church and this new life going, nothing could happen that would be, that would like take me away from the support that I'm going to get here. And that was like the most comforting thing for me. Mm, that's amazing. Yeah. 
really quickly, this is just a geek question. Did you view your Mormon family as saved or as not saved? I viewed them as totally saved because my optimistic self, I never believed in hell as this hellfire and brimstone where people are going to be tortured for their whole life. I kind of viewed hell as like a mindset. So, um, and that was just personal to me, but, um, I just, I couldn't, my dad almost died in 2019, the beginning of 2019. And in that moment, I just remember kind of being faced with that question for the first time. I had been a Christian for a couple of years at this point, And that was the first time where I'm going, Oh, a lot of people who lead me do believe that if he died in this moment, he would go to hell. And I just don't see, that's not how the God that I've been operating with works in my mind. So I just don't see my dad's like a really great person and has always been uh, like kind of the hero in my life. And, um, if he dies right now, I, he, I know he's not going to hell is basically what I would think. So I never got like this intense fear of hell that my ex evangelical friends talk about when they talk about their childhood. I never had that experience. So I did think they were saved my family. So Mormons were good in your mind. Mormons were good in my mind. As far as eternal damnation goes, right. Mormons were good in my mind. The reason I wanted to save them had nothing to do with eternal salvation and had everything to do with the fact that I felt like I could save the life that they have to still live here on earth. I could make that better. I could provide freedom for them yeah. while they're living here, but it had nothing. My desire to take all the Mormons out of Mormon church and bring them and make them all Christians had nothing to do with the fact that I was worried for their salvation. I like always kind of thought, no, they're good. Like they'll be fine, but I want to save, I want to make their life that they have now so much more free. Yeah. Less guilt and shame Less guilt and, and all shame. this amazing spirituality, not this boring right. dead religion that's yeah. not really focused on Christ. Right. Right. Like even the, even the subject of repentance, like my, my pastor would whip out scriptures and go, here's what repentance is. So we get loud and passionate at church because that's not what reverent, oh, sorry, not repentance, reverence, reverence. That's not what like reverence is about. And so I grew up thinking my arms have to be folded and my head has to be down in order for me to be reverent before the eyes of God. And here I am able to like cry and sing at the top of my lungs and cheer for Jesus. And I'm going, this makes way more sense. Like if somebody really died for you and was willing to give it all for your salvation and freedom, why wouldn't we cheer loudly? Why wouldn't we be passionate and loud about it? Why? And that all made sense to me. So this whole new life that I was experiencing so much freedom and lib liberation from since leaving Mormonism, I wanted every Mormon to experience that. Yeah. Since you yeah. mentioned the singing, uh, I'm going to put you on the spot here if, if you're comfortable. <laughs> like I've seen you sing, and you, I think you're an amazing <laughs> singer. Would you be comfortable singing, just pick some random Christian song that you would have really loved and yeah. just sing a little bit for our audience just to give them a sense of when I say you were a singer and when you say you sang – so they can get a sense of what is meant by that. <laughs> All right. <laughs> get to get the volumes you, ready, John. Jed. We may, need to tweak, <laughs> we may need to tweak the soundboard depending on the volume I'm like level. now trying to remember if I have. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Me, me, me. <laughs> <laughs> we sang this song. This is just the first one that came to my mind because when we start, we started the song at a big parking lot worship night that we had during COVID. In the beginning, it just goes, <laughs> it just goes, the atmosphere is changing now, for the Spirit of the Lord is here. The evidence is all around, for the Spirit of the Lord is here. And then it kind of goes into this place and you feel the build. This is where worship really meant a lot to me. You feel this build and it just goes, overflow in this place. Hit, fill our hearts with your love. Your love surrounds us. Spirit of God, fall fresh on us. We need your presence. And then, you know, we just go off and it's just, that was the angelic version. But when I go full-blown Tasha Cobbs, and only Christians will know that reference, but um, yeah, it, it 
there were some powerful moments that took place in, in worship. Do you feel that, Jen? Yeah. Did you feel the spirit? <laughs> you feel I the spirit? do. <laughs> I love music, though. I can't sing worth anything. But <laughs> listening, um, like, I still can't even give up all my LDS yeah, me either. songs. Yeah, me either. Yeah, I, I play them. <laughs> I love theater. So I um, in musicals. Oh, love it so much. Um, so they all kind of still speak to my soul. Yeah. Myself, you know, and what's inside me. I still love them. Yeah. So I keep what I like. If, if it's too much, I'll let it go. But yeah. How, no, about, I mean, how about her voice, though? But gorgeous. <laughs> like I can listen to her all day. I know, that right? is what I'm yeah. saying. Oh, yeah. my. Well, this is why we need, you know, we need like. Yeah, we need secular music to get with it in regards to I how know. we build songs. Because it. It, there's yeah. something really powerful about, about, about those songs. I mean, going from Mormon hymns to one of the last songs we ever sang on stage before I left was... <laughs> this song called I thank God. And it's, it's so, it's one of the fun ones. Cause we're a clapping church and the bridge is literally like hell lost another one. I am free. Yeah, I am free. And it's talking about like hell lost another one. Cause the person in the front just got <laughs> saved. The whole thing's hilarious to me now, but this music like really fires you up. Like you are just like, yes, we would be bouncing back and forth, high-fiving mid song with the other leaders on the, on the stage. Me and my sister had just the this this connection with worship together, where we could just read each other's minds and just go for it, and it and have these builds that were just awesome and drum breaks and music. Music saved my life in every season of life, and hymns honestly were EFY music saved my mm -hmm. life, and then worship music saved my life, mm. and then after that it was just Coldplay. <laughs> <laughs> That works. The closest yeah. thing I've found to the to okay. the build that I am so Still badly saving my craving. soul. Coldplay, yeah. <laughs> Coldplay, <laughs> saving my soul. Thanks, Chris Martin. Yeah. That's funny because Leah Leah Young and Cody Young took, oh, took their her. kids to Coldplay yeah. yesterday in Chicago. in Chicago. So this morning I was watching Leah Young's replay of them all jamming out at the cold. And it looked, it was like this huge stadium just full of people rocking out yeah. to Coldplay. And also Mark Oslin talked about his kind of spiritual experience in yeah. England watching Coldplay. Oh yeah, that's so right. Yeah. That's right. not the first time Coldplay's been mentioned on Mormon Story. <laughs> they, they're led by the spirit, I'm telling you. <laughs> Something, about about them. Them. Something about them. Yeah. yeah well, that was beautiful. So Thank funny. you for singing a little bit. Yeah, so. yeah I mean, anytime. You know, Please when I'm prepared, us. I'll come with a... I'll come with my guitar. Let us know when yeah. you have stuff that Jen's comes all out. Over that. Oh yeah, I'm all over that. <laughs> yeah, I'm writing sure. music right now. I'm honestly what I'm trying to do is is create exactly that. I'm trying to create music where people who have left religion, who that was their their spiritual language to God, where they can still feel those feels in a way that's not lyrically triggering to them. That's what mm. I hope to create yeah. a full album of. Yeah, mm, I love I'll that. just say you know. When I got kicked out of the church, we started this thing called Oasis, which was like a secular Sunday experience. And I've been surprised over the years. And then we did Thrive too, uh, which was another attempt at kind of secular community. And one of the most heartbreaking things for me was to see how many Mormons are traumatized by music. So just the act, even yeah. if you're singing like Imagine by John Lennon, right? just the act of being in a large group with other people singing can be traumatic and triggering. Mm. It's like they killed, they hurt music, they ruined music. I Mormonism know. ruined music for a <laughs> whole bunch of people. Not everyone, like I can still sing a primary, I can still sing popcorn popping, or sure. you know, I like to look for rainbows, you know, um, in, in a crowd and feel great. But there's people that wanna get up and leave and feel traumatized by that. And it makes mm. me super sad. It makes me so sad, well, because the, the level of of goodness that they felt in those moments was probably surrounded by those bigger musical moments and i remember these these really touching moments happening at like efy as a kid and i equated that to a spiritual experience and the same thing happened in worship and it's just like i have had and still have a really hard time in certain settings of music because i'm just like I get PTSD a little bit. Well, it's because that's it. part of how, I mean, I, I don't want to make it sound like every church is trying to manipulate you 
through music. I think right. it's just their way of worshiping. Sure. But because that's a tool, well, it makes you feel good because it makes you feel good, but also because that's how you kind of get pulled into the belief system and to the indoctrination and then to the um, commitment to the organization. Yeah. If you leave it, then it ends up feeling like a tool that was used to manipulate and coerce you. Totally. And that's what spoils it for people. Yeah. And it sucks because it's like, I can always look back on that and go, it was not used in that moment as manipulation um, and still have the triggers that I have. And I've, I, you know, I tried to, I, pr I tried to pray about that for a long time of just like remove these triggers um, because I wanted to listen to worship music so badly. It was just, it was, it was my everything. It was everything that I listened to for four years straight. I don't think I listened to secular music for like four years straight because mm. especially as a worship leader, my job is also to find songs that's the church is going to resonate with. So I have to know my church and my congregation really well to know what's going to make them touched, which in a way is manipulative. Like me as a worship leader, what did operate in realms of manipulation, not thinking at the time that that's what it was, but I've got to take some accountability here. Like we created set lists for big moments based off of what was going to make people cry at the perfect moment that we needed them to cry to set them up for this message or Something like that. And we would never phrase it like that yeah. back then, but that's totally what we yeah. were doing. Yeah. yeah. So it's hard. It's hard to wrestle with that. So we're we're hitting, I think we're hitting a natural point of where we're going to break for this part one, and then we're going to um, take a break and then do part two. But I have a couple final questions before we wrap up this part. Yeah. Really quickly, um, what was the Christian teaching around eternal families and eternal marriage I know, I know the answer, but I want you just to say it. Um, well, there's no, so for my knowledge, heaven, you're not really like in family units anymore. So you go up and it's just kind of everyone is now just brothers and sisters in Christ. And it's just like one big praise party. So there was no like eternal family situation. And as far as families being together forever and being saved, it's really just if you have a family member who does not accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior, that family member is going to hell. And um, that's something that I think people don't choose to wrestle with as active Christians because the thought of that is too much. Um, but yeah, as far as the theology goes, if you do not accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior in this life, you don't have the opportunity to do that after you die, kind of like how Mormon Church, I called it the waiting room where missionaries come and talk to you. I don't know how that works, but um, there's no opportunity after you die to like accept Jesus at that point. And that's actually biblically consistent. We talked about this with Sandra Tanner. The, Jesus literally says in the Bible, there's no wedding. There's no marriage right. in heaven. Right. Right. Yeah. So that's, and, and this has been one of the, the mind twists with Mormonism that was really interesting because Mormonism will say, Hey, we're the ones that help you, have eternal families. Yeah. But what they're actually doing is creating scarcity. Instead of creating a gift, they're creating scarcity because all the other Christians are just like, oh, we're all going to be there. Right. Right? Yeah. So it's Mormonism that's actually, in a, in a way, theologically breaking up families. Even if everybody gets the Mormon baptism through baptisms for the dead and ends up, you know, in one of the three kingdoms, the kingdoms are stratified. And so they're being separated. And then is that not hell to be separated from your daughter or your dad or your brother? So yeah. it's still a form of hell. So they create, they, they sell it like it's some huge eternal family uniting thing, but really what they're doing is selling you fear and scarcity that you're not going to be with your spouse or your kids someday. Right. But in a traditional Christian mindset, everyone's going to be together. Is that right? Everyone's going to be, they, unless they don't believe. But then you had basically just said, ah, oh, Jesus, God's going to make up for it somehow. So you weren't dwelling in that place of I wasn't dwelling in that hell. place, but I do remember a very specific conversation that I had with my two lead pastors who were, who were married, their grandmother, who was Mormon. That, that's just super random. They do have extended family who was Mormon. That was a, a weird coincidence. Their grandma, who was Mormon, passed away. And I remember being at their house like right after that. And one of my pastors is like, well, it's just, I mean, I'm just at peace, like knowing where she is. And his wife goes, well, we don't really know where she is. <laughs> and he's like, 
No, I know where she is. She was a devout, she loved Jesus. Yes, she was a devout Mormon, but she loved Jesus. And, 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 and she just, his wife kind of was like, all right, whatever. And I thought the whole thing was weird for so many reasons. One, she's going, think, implying that she thinks that this grandma is in hell, but she's not upset about it <laughs> from what I can see. She's not visibly upset about it. So I'm like, okay, weird. And then <laughs> the same, like, and then the other pastor is like now dealing with this, this, this thing of just, oh wait, no, it doesn't make sense that an amazing woman like my grandma would be in hell, but his beliefs say that that's where she is. So he, I saw in that moment wrestled with that. So I don't, that's why I say like even pastors, I don't think they actually really think about that to a certain degree because it's painful because if they really believe what the Bible is saying, according to their interpretation, that's a lot of people to permanently bury when they die. That's, that's a lot to do with. And that's similar to a lot of Mormons don't totally think about the implications of their beliefs yeah. or believe them super literally, or they'll make exceptions when it's people close to them. We all, we all ma right. manage our cognitive dissonance flexibly, yeah. I guess, regardless of our religious tradition. Right? Yeah. There's, you know, I always said there was cafeteria Mormons and there's cafeteria Christians. You just yeah. pick and choose kind of what you want to believe that makes the most sense for the situation that you're currently dealing with <laughs> yeah. in that moment. Yeah. And you didn't tell us what converted your sister. Like, and it's okay. Uh, like, I did. <laughs> older, no, she followed younger me. Sister, She's six you were the years oldest. younger than me. She's six years younger than me. And she was kind of one of those Mormons who was never fully in it mentally. So mm -hmm. her leaving the Mormon church wasn't like this huge traumatic experience um, spiritually or mentally. But she saw... Uh, how how much I was um, thriving now at this church, and it didn't really take long before she joined, and then she very quickly got roped into the worship team and was totally cared for in the same type of sense. So she absolutely loved it. She okay. would consider herself way more of a ex-Christian than an ex-Mormon at this mm. point. Oh, okay. And she sings like you do? Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. I want to see those duets. <laughs> Oh, she will be on the album for sure. All my sisters are gonna be are gonna okay. be on this album. I can't okay. wait. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Last question. Um, so the next episode is gonna be sort of your rise in your religion in in this church towards becoming a pastor or a worship leader, and then how that kind of fell apart yeah. to to where you now identify as an ex Christian. So that's what. That's what next episode is going to be about. Um, I just want to end with this question. Um, and Jen, if you have any others, but like, I think of evangelical Christianity as not having female leaders. It's still a patriarchal church mm -hmm. system. So, but then there's this Joyce Myers woman who's like yeah. a, a pastor, a female pastor. So like, what, what is the possibility? Excuse me. What is the possibility for a woman in evangelical Christianity? Um, it totally depends on the sect of Christianity that you're in. And in my church, I just so happen to luck out and fall into a very progressive, female empowered church where we had women pastors. Oh. And my main pastor, who preached most of the time, that was a man. But his wife preached a lot too. And, um, we had female pastors, we had couples who were men and women lead campuses and, and they were going to eventually make me one. So, um, even as a single person. So, um, yeah, there is a very specific scripture passage and I don't remember where it's at, but I'll find it that talks about that, the issue of women. And depending on how you were taught to interpret that in Bible school, you could land either which way. It's about women staying silent in the church, right? Yeah, it's something that Paul it's said. Paul. It's yeah. yeah, it's Paul. Um, and but they'll interpret it. They'll be like, "Well, if you know the hermeneutic and the homiletic behind this certain situation, <laughs> yeah, then you would know that this meant this because he was trying to protect the women from blah blah blah." So they <laughs> they made it uh, whatever they wanted. But uh, luckily for me, I was in a very um, highly female empowered situation where a lot of our guest speakers who would come in for conferences were women and uh, people of color. They tried to like bring that in as well. So. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. All right. So next episode is going to be how Rachel got fast tracked into Christian leadership, but then how it all fell apart. 
Yes. Is that all right? Yes. Yes. That's uh, that's part two. Ooh, that's part two. All right. Well, this has been wonderful. Jen, any any final questions for Rachel? or? No, I think I'm good. I'm excited to hear what's happening next. Right. <laughs> well, Rachel, thank you so much for sharing this part of your story. It's, it's, it's not the traditional Mormon story. And that's one of the reasons I love it. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, your willingness to be honest and open and vulnerable about your story. I know there's going to be a lot of people, even my Christian friends like Randy or Steve or Allison or others or Sandra, I know they're going to really value hearing your experience uh, converting to Christianity or, or evangelical Christianity. So thank yeah, you for sharing. Absolutely. It's been a blast. Thanks for having me. Yeah. And, and Randy and Steve and Allison and Sandra, you don't have to watch the next part. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I promise. I still love all of you guys. Okay. <laughs> all right. Thanks, Rachel. Thanks, Jen. It's great to have you, you as always. Yeah, it was fun. Yeah. Thanks, Jen. Yeah. I'll bring my guitar next time. Yes, please do. <laughs> I can't wait. I can't we'll wait. open with a song. We'll have an opening prayer oh. and an opening <gasps> song. Okay. <laughs> I'm up for it. Whatever you want to do. <laughs> All right, everyone. Um, don't go away. Come right back. Uh, if you happen to catch the live stream, it'll be tomorrow. But for everyone else, just jump right into part two on YouTube, on the podcast, uh, Facebook, wherever you are. You won't want to miss how Rachel Wonderly goes from passionate evangelical Christian to ex-Christian and where she has landed. Um, Thanks for all the support. Thanks for making Mormon stories possible. And we'll see you guys all uh, really soon for part two. Thanks, everybody.